Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, and I'm ready if you are for another mysterious voyage through the shadowy mist of imagination. You ask, what is the world? And most people will answer, the Earth, the universe. But isn't it true that for most people, the real world is a certain house on a definite street in a particular town? And for most people, doesn't the real world consist of perhaps a... Uh, 50 or 100 or so faces? And isn't everything and everyone else just a name in a newspaper? An image on a screen? A voice speaking from a small box? Close your eyes. Stop up your ears. And there is no world. I have something to tell you, Harry. Yes? You have just become the most powerful man in the world. Me? Yes, you. You, Harry Cohen. You have just become more powerful than any dictator, king, or czar. Mightier than any general, emperor, or president. Are you sure you feel all right? Listen, in a terrible storm outside. Yes? You can end it. By saying just one word, say yes, and the storm will be over. You can't be serious. Try it. Say yes, and see what happens. All right. No, no, not all right. Yes. Yes. What did I do? What did I do? mystery drama, The 36th Man, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ross Martin. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Sometimes, when we are particularly appalled by the flagrant evil, the unspeakable inhumanity, 
and the dark ignorance that seems to engulf us constantly, we may ask ourselves, why does the Lord permit this most imperfect planet to exist? Why? Perhaps the answer is written in the old Hebrew legend which tells us that there are, in every generation, 36 human beings whose lives are completely without blemish. And it is for their sake that the Lord allows the world to continue. And since the Hebrew letters Lamed and Vav form the symbols for the number 36, these persons are called Lamed Vovniks. And so long as there will always be 36 of these saintly people in each generation, the world shall not be lost. Our tale begins in the opening years of the 1900s down in the Lower East Side of New York City in a tiny candy store. Harry! Where are you? Harry? Ruth? I was down in the cellar. Oh, you were down in the cellar. I was uh, putting away the empty bottles. Mm -hmm. And while you're downstairs, anybody could come in and walk away with the whole store. Oh, Ruth, the people in this neighborhood are honest. Is that why we're always short newspapers? Well, maybe when we count them, we don't add right. And the candy bars disappear off the counter by magic, huh? Well, you know, sometimes it could be our mistake. Oh, please, give me a You know, rest. the truth is the eye, the human eye, it very often deceives a person. Sometimes you think oh, you see something... Oh, that's enough. Ruth? Are you angry? Who, me? Angry? What would I have to be angry about? I'm just trying to explain don't, that... Don't, don't. Whatever you say, it'll be wrong. And I'll lose my temper. I don't want to do that. So just just keep quiet. I know how much you hate this place, Ruth. If you want, I can stay here by myself. Oh, sure. sure. I don't want you to come in afternoons anymore. After all, why shouldn't you be free? Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you so much for my wonderful freedom. Mr. Enrico Caruso and Miss Nellie Melba are singing at the Metropolitan Opera. Now I'm free to use our box seat. Oh, Ruth, I wish I could afford some... And afterwards, I'll be free to join Mr. Diamond Jim Brady and Miss Lillian Russell for supper at Rector's. Please, Ruth. Don't just stand there. Bring in the newspapers, will you? Why? Can't you hear why? But the sun is... The sun was shining so brightly just a minute ago. It's a storm. Hurry before we lose all the papers. Yes, yes, you're right. I'm going, I'm going. Here, here, hand them to me. Why such a storm all of a sudden? Shut the door, shut the door. Oh, look at these papers. What's the matter? Look at the comic pages. Oh. Half of them torn. Dirty finger marks everywhere. Now, how can we sell... Did you let the kids read the funny papers again? Well... Did you? Oh, but Ruth, most of these children can't afford to buy a newspaper. Who do you think you are? Mr. Andrew Carnegie? Now, how many times do I have to tell you we're not running a free public library? No, I... Get your head out of the clouds. Ruth, please. Now, you the... can't give away a whole quart of milk in a five-cent mold. I know that. So if you know, why do you do it? These children are so poor. Nobody's as poor as we are. Well, kids shouldn't grow up without a piece of candy now and then. A toy, a funny paper. What? If you could only hear how the kids laugh when they look at the funny oh, pages. Oh, where do you get this from? This sickness is so happy you don't even notice how thin, how scrawny Craziness. they are. Craziness. It doesn't run in your family. Your brothers are sensible. They're rich, important. Ruth, everything will be all oh, right. Pick the lemon. You'll see. Where are you going? In the back. To look through the bills. I don't know why. There's no money to pay them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It isn't easy, is it? No. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear anyone come in. Hello, Harry. You say my name as if you know me. I've been looking for you, Harry. Why would anybody be looking for me? After all, who am I? It's been such a long trip, and I'm so tired. Well, here, please, sit down. Huh? Uh, 
Can I offer you a little something? Milk or something? Let me look at you, Harry. You're very pale. You're trembling. Mister, are you sick? Let me see if what they said about you is true. There's a doctor just up the block. I think it's true. It doesn't charge much. If you don't have enough money, maybe I can help. All right? I'm very old, Harry. My time is up. Oh, what kind of talk? I'll take you to this doctor. But I can't. I can't leave this world until I find somebody to take my place. Do you understand? Poor old man. What's troubling you? Harry, just tell me, assure me, that you'll always be just the way you are right now. Tell me, you must. Will you take my place? See who? Who are you? Harry! Do you have to chew the fat with every old bum that walks in? The syrup jars have to be washed. Yes, Ruth, I'll do it. And you, Mr. Bum, this is no flop house. On your way. Oh. Who, who are you? I'm one of the 36. The 36? There must always be 36 of us, so the world is lost, comes to an end. You you sit here. It'll only take a minute. I'll get the doctor. Each of us, before he dies, must name the man to succeed him. I choose you. Now here, first, you, you drink this, huh? You, you look very, very... Do you accept? You must try to be calm. Because Mr. I'm dying and I have no successor. The world, the world is ending here and now. The world is ending. Oh, no, no, no. Everything is all... Right. I it's tell all... you, the world is ending. Ah, look, look, look outside. Have you ever seen a storm like this? Have you? It will destroy the whole world. It's excitement. It's not good for you. The world, it's lost unless there is a new 36th man. Take my place. You must do it quickly. Quickly before no, I don't, don't, don't get up. Don't try to get up, please. Say yes, Harry. Say yes. And suddenly there is an end to thunder and lightning, the wind. Suddenly, every cloud will disappear. A bright sun will shine in a peaceful heaven. Just rest. Now try to... Say rest. yes. Only you can save the world. Say yes. Me? Me save the world? Yes, oh. you. Only you can save the world. Harry, Harry, say yes. Harry. Yes, yes, all right, yes. All right now? Yes. Now it's all right. Listen. I don't hear anything. That's right. You don't hear. The storm that was sent to destroy the world stopped in its tracks because of you. Stopped because you just became the 36th man. Uh, fine, fine. Now, let me take you to the doctor. We must always be 36. And you must never change. Before I die, I have the power to grant my successor one request. Ask for anything... Ask, what? What do you really want in this world? Oh, I would want for people to have enough. No, 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 no. This must be for yourself. What would you really want? <laughs> what I'd really want, if it could somehow be arranged, it would be wonderful. If my wife, Ruth... Well, if she just understood me a little better. Is it all right to ask for that? That's all you want? That's really all I want. Then one day she shall. One day, when you least expect it, she will suddenly understand you. Now, goodbye, Harry. I must leave. Oh, but look at you. You can't even walk. One need not be able to walk in order to leave this world. <laughs> here, 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 lean on me. Ruth, Ruth, quick, help me. Ruth. Goodbye, Lame Dvovni. Goodbye. <laughs> The old man. The old man. We have to help the old man. 
Harry, Harry, listen to Harry, me. Harry, listen to the doctor. The doctor, yes, yes, the doctor. This is very old man, my store, doctor. No, 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 Harry. We're in the store right now. Now, your wife says you keep shouting for help. Now, what happened? There was an old man here. What old man? He fell to the floor. He said he was dying. I yelled, I yelled for you to help me. But... There was no old man. Well, you saw him. I saw him? Yes, you saw him. You asked him to leave the store. When was this? When? Five, ten minutes ago. Now, you sure you're not imagining all this, Harry? Now, why should I suddenly well, say... It's too hard, Doctor. He doesn't get enough sleep. He forgets to eat. You mean that... There was no old man? Where is he? He seemed... So... Just like a real person. We talked to each other, and he... He just fell dead on the floor. If he fell dead, Harry, where is he? Doctor, did you ever hear of the, the Lama Dvovniks? Yes. The old man said he was a Lama Dvovnik. Oh, the old man again. Yeah, he had chosen me as his successor. Harry, it was a hallucination. You thought you saw him. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I saw him. He was real. To you? He was in that chair. He was real. He was in your mind. There are new things, Harry. An entirely new dimension of the mind is being opened, explored. I wonder what that Dr. Freud would say. Who? There's a Dr. Freud in Vienna. Something new. He's what they call a mind doctor. I wonder what he would say about your old man. What could he say? He's never seen him. I think I'll write to this Dr. Freud. He's involved with everything that happens inside the mind. But the old man wasn't inside my mind. He was inside the store. No, Harry. I know what I saw. Why are you arguing with the doctor? You can't even run your own business. You're trying to tell him all about his. Look, all I'm trying to say... Never was this... mind what you say. Does the doctor say there was no old man? Yes, but then I... Then there was no old man. And that's the end of it. Oh, she can say that. But you and I, we know that isn't the end of it. No, sir. If anything, it's only the beginning. You will have to give the devil his due. And I mean that literally when I shall return shortly with Act Two. Jewish legend tells us that the Lord allows this sinful world to exist so long as there are 36 saintly souls in each generation. And they are known as Lamed Vovniks. Harry Cohen, a very kind, very humble little shopkeeper on the Lower East Side of New York City, has just succeeded a dying member of the group, thus keeping the roster at the required 36. Ruth, his wife, refuses to take Harry seriously. However, there's always a first time for everything. And right now, Harry is about to be taken very seriously indeed by, um... <laughs> well, since you would never guess, I'll come right out with it. The devil. You don't believe it? I can prove it. The very next voice you'll hear will be Satan himself. Yes. Who? Ah, I suppose you might just as well let her come in. Ah, uh, Prince. Don't use that irritating title. Well, I can't very well call you the king of the universe. You're only the prince of darkness. So far. Your district captain in New York hears that the new Islam Advovnik is in his territory. So? Well, it might present you with a quick way to destroy the world. There is no quick way. Slow and steady is how to go. Now, in eight or ten years, I'm arranging for a war. Oh, there have always been wars. Ah, but this will be a world war. Oh, you've had those before. Ah, but not with these weapons. 
Oh, the weapons they'll have this time. Now, in about a year, there's going to be an invention called the aeroplane. A machine that flies through the sky. You can drop bombs from it. Destroy entire cities. I'm going to let them invent weapons so awful that one man will be able That's to... That's always been your problem. What problem? Your gadget, Happy. Now, I have a simple plan whereby you can destroy the world this very afternoon. You have? The new Islamic Vavnik. Yes. Just help him fall from grace, as it were. Impossible. No one has ever been able to get a Lamed Vavnik. Mm, you never asked me to help. Uh, your specialty is wasted. They're mostly elderly men. Long ago, they abandoned the pursuit of earthly pleasure. Or maybe it abandoned them. Mm, this new one is young. Young? I even think he's handsome. Oh, well. This place is everything in a brand new perspective. Are you seducing anybody important these days? Oh, a couple of kings, a few presidents, some generals. <laughs> uh, let's go after this one. Uh, what's his name again? Harry. Harry Cohen. Harry? Harry Cohen. Hmm? What? Oh, yes, Ruth. What are you doing there? Oh, I, I was uh, just reading a book. Oh, oh, that's uh, wonderful. Oh, yes, Ruth, it is wonderful. It's a book about bees. Mm -hmm. Bees, this is a new affliction. It shows how bees talk to each oh, other. Bees no, talk no. by the way they dance around each other. You may just think it's aimless, buzzing around without rhyme or reason, but every motion means something. And while you've got your nose buried in that book, anybody can come in and walk off with the whole story. Oh, no, Ruth. I was watching. Listen. I have to go see my brother. Oh. All right. Say hello to him from... Uh, oh, no. The very mention of your name gives him indigestion. Now, just tell me. Can I trust you not to give away the store while I'm gone? Oh, Ruth. No, no. Don't answer. I'll just have to pray for a miracle. Ruth. I just wish I could make her happy. There it is, Lilith, my dear. The shop of Harry Cohen. You gonna hang around for the kill, Prince? I still say you're not going about it in the right way. I'll tell you what you do, Prince. You go get yourself an umbrella. Because in five minutes... There's going to be the biggest storm in the history of the world. I hope so. Hello, Harry. Yes, what can I do for you? Did anyone ever tell you how handsome you are? No. Well... You just listen to Mama, Harry, baby. Well, they never told me because it isn't true. I mean, hmm. why should people tell me I'm handsome? As my father used to say, his face is not a sport. <laughs> you just come here, Harry, honey. Listen, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know your name. Lily, honey. Lily. Mm -hmm. I don't have very much money. Money? No. Oh, sweetie, you said anything about money. But maybe I can help you. Help me? Yes. If you need a few dollars so that you can... So that mm -hmm. you can... Uh, so I can what? So that you can... Quit. Quit? Quit this terrible life you lead. Oh, oh just, just wait a minute, Harry. Lily, I don't judge people. After all, which person has the right? All we can do is help one another, right? I mean, seriously. 
Hey, who, who do you think you're talking to? I know to? who I'm talking to. A child of misfortune, a child of sorrow. Oh, now, now listen, Harry. But it's Harry. not your fault. Something tells me it's not your uh, fault. Harry, just... Maybe uh, you didn't have parents. Harry, relax. Maybe there was no one to love you, no one to teach you. Oh, why not enjoy life, Harry? Yes, exactly. Life is so short. What better way to enjoy it than by helping another human being? Harry, we could have such a good time, you and me. Here, here. A few dollars. It's not much, but it's all I have. You take it. Harry, uh, Harry, you're not listening. First wash all the paint and powder off mm. your face, and then buy yourself some nice clothes and get yourself a job. A job? There's a factory right down the street. They make shirt waists. Uh, Harry, Harry, let me explain They something. always need girls. Harry, that's not what It'll I had in mind. It'll change your whole life. You'll feel better. No. You'll take the money. Get a new start. No, no. Are you afraid to break with the past? Foolish girl. The good Lord is so filled with love, with forgiveness. Oh, let me out of here. Let me out of here. Well, I don't see a cloud in the sky. That man isn't human. Ah, but he is. He is. And that's why we will do this my way. Now get rid of those clothes. Hmm? Get an old black dress. Black? A torn black shawl. Put some white in your hair, some lines in your face. You'll be a poor widow, oh, lady. Oh, but I... And make sure that butter doesn't melt in your mouth. Oh, but Prince... And don't call me Prince. Ah, uh, e excuse me. Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. How much for these candies? Those? They're two for a penny. Oh, well, uh, I, I would need four because there's Joey and Sarah and Tessie and Benny and... Uh, well, uh, never... <laughs> thank you. Well, don't you want the candy? Uh, well, no, no, because I, I can only spare one penny. You see, otherwise I, I won't be able to buy milk. You mean you can't spare a penny for candy? Mm. Well, well, not this week. Here. You take this. Oh, no. Now take Oh, no, no. Why not? Well, because, because it's charity and charity, I... Charity, what a beautiful word. It really means love, you know. It's what people should do for each other. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I have my pride. But you have four little children. Shouldn't each of them have a piece of candy? No, not unless I could afford it. Why should they pay for your pride? Huh? I take it. Come on, just take it. Well. You're new. I haven't seen you before. Well, I, I just moved across the street, top floor. Oh, w what's that book on the counter? It, it looks familiar. Oh, do you read? Mm, well, no. No, m my husband did before he died. Ah, uh -huh. it's a book on philosophy. Oh, yes. That sounds like what he used to read. He must have been an educated man. Oh, yes. He, he was a man like you, very kind, very intelligent. Oh, he would come home from work at night and he would read to me from the philosophy book. Oh, that's what I, I, I miss so much. Well, bye. Goodbye. Where's the record for the syrup? I forgot to keep it. Ruth, what I... do you do all day that you can't keep the simplest figures? I said I was sorry. I'll try to do better. Those books. That's what you're busy with, this junk. Uh, no, Ruth, now that's Garbage, not junk. garbage, nonsense. In any of these books, is there even one word that can tell you how to make a dollar? Ruth, it is written, man does not live by bread alone. I'll make a bargain with you, Mr. Philosopher. You live on books... And I'll live on bread, and we'll see who lives longest. Look, let me read you something beautiful from philosophy. Here, here, listen to this. No, no. You listen. You go home. You eat your supper. You go to sleep. Because six o'clock tomorrow morning, you have to be here to open the store. Oh, but Ruth, I, I just want to read this to you. All I want in this life is a little peace and quiet. This is such a beautiful thought. I... I, I have to share it with somebody. Leave me alone, will you please? I share too much with you as it is. Just a minute. 
Good evening. Oh, well, good evening. I, uh, I brought a bottle of milk for your children. Oh, oh, you're so kind. Well, it's nothing. No, it's everything. And, uh, and there's this paragraph in, in a book of philosophy that I, I, I'd like to read to you. Oh, well, oh, uh, won't you come in? Won't you come in? Never did so devious a spider speak such honeyed words to so an unsuspecting a fly. And the battle is on. The ceaseless, the eternal battle between the forces of good and evil. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. WBBM Chicago. <laughs> You know, of course, that the old Jewish legend tells that the Lord allows this sinful world to continue only because in each generation there are 36 saintly souls called Lamed Vovniks. Should there ever be one less than this required number, the world will be immediately destroyed. Satan, unfortunately, is also aware of the situation, and he has sent Lilith, the seductress, to work her evil charms. The fate of the world hangs on the outcome of the next scene. Won't you, uh, come in? Oh, thank you. My, uh, my children are asleep. And now, thanks to you, they will have milk tomorrow morning. Oh, please, say no more about it. I came, uh, I, I came across this, this passage mm -hmm. in a book, and uh, I, I just thought you might like to hear it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, this is what I miss most, just talking, having my husband read to me, explain to me. Your wife, she must be a, a fortunate woman to have a, a man like you. Well... Mm, to have a philosopher, a, a sage for a husband, to live with wisdom every day. Oh, well, it was just this passage that I came across. It, it says... It is truth that turns a hovel into a palace that makes a youth handsome and a maiden fair that transforms all the base metal within us into pure and shining gold. Hmm. Yes, and there is more than the truth we know. There is the truth we feel, the truth that beats in our hearts. Yes. The truth that Pounds in our pulse. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit close in here, isn't it? Harry, hmm? there is this truth between you and me. Uh, I, I think I'd better go. Are you afraid? afraid? No, no. I, I, I just should have been home a long time ago. Where is home, Harry? What is home? Well, I, I look. Uh, oh, look! It's starting to rain. Home is where the truth abides. Rain. The moon was shining so brightly before. Oh, don't deny the truth, Harry. Such a rain. All of a sudden, where did it come from? Poor Harry. Bold enough to speak the truth, but too timid to live it. Why are you afraid, Harry? I, I, I'm not afraid. Then no. obey the command of your heart, your senses. What do they command you to do? You're, you're so beautiful. Well, then why are you afraid of me? Didn't the poet say beauty is truth? Yes. Come to me, Harry, and learn the truth. Yes. No! No, no, I see you now. I know who you are. No! No! Harry, I know where Harry. the rain is coming from. I'll stop it! I'll stop it! Harry! Harry, you come back here! Harry, come back! Well, another brilliant performance that gets us nowhere, my dear. I give up. He's all yours. Yes, Lily. He's all mine. He doesn't know that yet. But soon he will be all mine. I wish you luck. Not luck. Skill. If you really want a man, you work on his wife. And she has a brother, a wealthy brother. 
And tonight, he will have a dream. Ruth? Jacob, what are you doing here? Oh, Ruth, what you just said, it's a knife through my heart. What did I just say? You asked me what I'm doing here with such with such surprise in your voice. Well, yes, because because you never come here. And that's my sin. I have one sister. I never visit her. I never ask myself, does she need anything? Jacob? Jacob, you better sit. Now let me let me get you something to drink, a, li- a little soda. Uh, put a little syrup in it. You are sick. I really haven't been a good brother. Yes, that's true. You haven't. But now I'm going to make up for it. You are? My sister. My little sister. She isn't going to waste her youth and her beauty in a candy store. Jacob, you want to go in the back maybe? Lie down? Am I a brother-in-law? Such a splendid person, a man with a heart of gold. That's true. And a brain. Such a brain. I'm getting old. I need help. I need a man. A brilliant man who can run my business for me. A man like Harry. No, no, no. What you don't need is a man like Harry. Harry, what a wonderful person. A man in a million. Now he's ready for real responsibility. But Jacob... I want Harry to become my right-hand man. This is Jacob? My brother? Send your husband to see me the first thing tomorrow morning. Harry? Yes, it's Harry. Did you go see my brother? Yes. Well? Well, tell me. Did you ever suspect such a thing? Look at you. You're still in a daze. Yes. His house... He lives in a palace. He has five bedrooms. He can only sleep in one of them at a time. Where do you want to live, Harry? Live. Of course, live. We're certainly not going to live in this neighborhood anymore. Why not? Why not? Because we're going to sell the store. Why are we going to sell the store? Why? Well, because... Because... Harry, what did you and Jacob talk about? We talked about a a job, and he... uh... And what happened? What happened? Uh... Well, I... I... Well, the way it ended, he threw me out of the house. What? He lost his temper. What did you do? I didn't do anything. What did you say? I didn't say anything. You know, Jacob, he has a very strong temper. Harry, tell me. Everything started at the beginning. Well, when I got there, he was already angry. Why? Because I was late. You see, there was an old man on the car, and he was afraid to travel alone, so I had to go to his stop with him, and then... Just tell me. Well, Jacob said he wanted me to help him take care of his money. And you said... I said, how wonderful. Oh, then you did take the job. Well, what I said was, uh, what a wonderful opportunity to help people. Help people? Well, isn't that the best way to take care of money, Ruth? Feed people who are hungry, clothe people, send an orphan child to school. I can see where we're going. He laughed. He thought it was a joke. Can you imagine? He said, money isn't something you give to people. Money is something you take from Harry, people. Harry, Harry. He wanted me to learn about money by starting to collect rent. You! And if a person couldn't pay to... To put him out. No, now, now, now. You wouldn't have to. No, I said I couldn't. And then he wanted he wanted me to work in his store. Well, that's better. Better. Ruth, he cheats people. How dare you say that about he my... He charges body. too much. He doesn't give them right weight. So, you're not taking the job. Oh, please, Ruth, please. Please, Ruth. Now she won't talk to me for a whole week. Hello, Harry. Oh, hello, Doctor. Uh, How are you feeling, Harry? See any more Lamed Vovniks lately? Oh, no, please, Doctor. I don't feel so good right now, huh? Oh, what's wrong? Oh, an argument with my wife. 
Uh, that's what I came to see you about. Hmm? I got a letter from this specialist in Vienna. An answer from this Dr. Freud. Very interesting. Yes. Now, why do you believe you became a Lamedvovnik? Why do I believe? I know. The old man was here. The storm. He died. Harry, you needed it. I needed it. You manufactured it for your own self-esteem. What does that mean? It means you realize deep inside that you failed your wife. I failed her? All the things she wants, she can't have. Clothes, theater parties, money. Those things, they, they're not important. Not to you. But they mean so much to Ruth. Isn't it more important to help one's neighbor? And so, to give importance to yourself, to convince yourself that what you're doing is right, you make it appear that if you stop letting people walk all over you, then the world will come to an end. But that isn't what I'm doing. It could look that way to somebody else. Besides, Harry, what makes you so sure you're the one who's right? Hello, Ruth. Ruth, please talk to me. Ruth? Why are you handing me this piece of paper? Oh, I see. Harry, I will not talk to you until you go to work for my brother and take your head out of the clouds. All right, Ruth. I'm going. What? Tomorrow morning, I'm going. Harry, you don't mean it. Yes, yes, I mean it. Oh, Harry. Oh, we'll be so happy. You keep saying, who am I to judge? And yet I judge constantly. Where is it written that I, Harry Cohn, must starve on a crust, freeze in a cellar? I've spent the first part of my life giving. I'll spend the rest of it taking. Harry, what's the matter with you? Nothing, nothing's the matter. No, 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 you won't fool me. The world isn't ending. Harry, what's the matter with your face? My face, my face. It's so, so hard. What? Why do you look so mean? I don't like that look. I've stopped fooling myself. That's all what arrogance. To think I'm one of the Lord's chosen. Rage and howl. I don't believe you. The world will go on. What do you say? I won't wait until tomorrow. I'll go to him now. The sooner the better. He's a fool. He thinks he knows how to make money. He knows how to sweat pennies from the poor. I'll teach him tricks. He never dreamed of. No, he don't. No, what? You want money? Furs? Jewels? And if his wife will be a bigger woman beside you. Don't go! You think I'm afraid of that storm? Let go of me, let go! Don't go, don't go. I don't want you to go. You want? I, I don't like you this way. I don't want you this way. Oh, Harry. Why do I make you so miserable? Ruth. Why do I want to change you? I love you. Just the way you are. Just the way you are. Yes, Harry. Mm. One day, when you least expect it, she will understand you. Your wife will understand you. You're the sweetest. Sweetest person in the whole world. I, I don't care if you're not rich, if you're not important. I love you. Oh, look, it's such a nice night. Go upstairs, get some rest. But you look tired. Yes, Ruth. I am tired. You look at Harry. So tired. You look as if the whole world is resting on your shoulders. And according to what is written in one of the old legends, the world is resting on Harry's shoulders. As an additional thought, if a sudden storm should upset the weatherman's predictions for a beautiful day, remember... Someone of 36 people may be having a momentary lapse because, after all, even the saintliest of humans 
still are human. I'll be back shortly. You may pass him or her on the street without knowing it. You may look at some insignificant, retiring, unimportant person and never know that he, assisted by 35 others, holds your fate, your life, your world. We think the world is saved by the strong, the mighty, the powerful. But no, they can't save it. They can only destroy it. Remember, it is the meek who not only inherit the earth, but maintain it as well. Our cast included Ross Martin, Anne Petoniak, Robert Harris, Carol Titel, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Every cop in this city is looking for you, top dog. Dave, don't bait him. That's okay, lady. I know it. You really shoot Mrs. Scofield? Ah, she caught me. She caught me going through her apartment. You shoot an old woman in cold blood? Well, she seen me, didn't she? No. Listen, baby. I'm a three-time loser. Now, I got nothing to lose. What's that poor little thing? You... Ah, she... she could have pulled me out of the file. She seen me. When anybody sees me on a job, gets it. Anybody catches me on a job, gets it. Hey, that's where you get a break, man. Now, ain't you glad you're blind, huh? You couldn't give him a make on me. Hmm? Hey, lady. Hey, lady, you blind like your husband? No, no, yes, I'm yes, not... Yes, yes, we're both blind. <laughs> so, you've seen me too, lady. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. The story you are about to hear is true, but strange. Night comes, day like this. I brought you out here to talk, Alan. Talk about us. Yes, sir? Of course, it throws me off my bearings. Like as not, I'll pile the westward up on Dead Man's Reef the way you put everything else out of my mind. Father, you talked to my father? You know I have. The only one I ain't talked to is you. I can't seem to get him the nerve. Well, and here I am. Yeah. Alice. What is that? What happens with Dead Man's Bell? Boss, there's somebody in ain't on the buoy ringing the bell as a signal. Someone's in danger.
ABC Radio Network presents Strange, True Stories of the Supernatural with your narrator, famous author, lecturer, and expert on strange and weird events, Walter Gibson. Thank you, Charles Woods. There are many treacherous reefs off the rocky coast of Maine, but none more dangerous than Dead Man's Reef. And there is no true story stranger than the story of the voice out of the storm. While the westward stood off Dead Man's Reef, a small boat was lowered and went in toward the buoy. Fortunately, the water was at ebb tide, quiet and calm. The man who was picked off the buoy lapsed into unconsciousness and opened his eyes in the ship's cabin to see Alice bending over him. I guess I, I've gone to heaven. Angel like you. You would have very soon if it hadn't been for Bart. Bart? Mm-hmm. First mate on the westward. He went in and took you off the buoy. I'll have to thank him. We're taking you into shore now. You're in bad shape. Yeah, I guess so. Five days drifting is no help for anybody. Is that what happened to you? A uh, schooner found it in the northeast. Oh. I don't know who else made it. I found a plank, waterlogged. I had to swim. If you hadn't been able to signal with that bell, you'd have been done for. The plank was going under. I saw the boy and swam for it. That's all I remember. You were about to slip off back into the water again. That would have been the end. Gee, I have to thank Bart for saving my life. What you have to do now is rest for a good long while. Plenty of rest. Yeah, I guess so. And I... I can't think of a better nurse than you. <laughs> My name's Phil Denby. What's yours? Even then, it was obvious to Alice Tripp that the rescued man was falling in love with her. And although she refused to admit it even to herself, there was something about him that made her almost forget Bart. And a week later, Bart put it into words. Gray, I pulled this guy off dead man's reef more dead than alive. And now I'm the one that's dead. Bart, what are you talking about? About that Denby guy. Been in your house all week, hasn't he? You've been nursing him back to health. Bart, it was the least I could do. This is a small town in no hospital. Bart, Phil's great, eh? Hmm? He said so, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Now it's Phil, huh? Well, I can't quite call him Mr. Denby, can I? Alice, you remember what we were talking about a week ago out in the westward before that bell began to ring. I never got around to asking you. But I still feel the same way. You know I do. I want... Bart, please, not now. No. Like that, huh? I... I don't want to hurt you. Sure not. I shouldn't ask. Is that it? Okay, let's talk about something else. It's a, it's a lovely day, isn't it? That's a good, safe subject. Now, if you're going to ask that... Why way. shouldn't I? For five years I've been thinking of you. Seeing you most every day, first mate on your father's boat. All of a sudden, some guy comes ashore on a piece of driftwood. I should have left him there, right there on Dead Man's Reef. Bart, he'll be on board with you. He's what? Yes, on the westward. Your father gave him a job? Yes, as soon as he's well. If he comes on board, I'll... I'll... You'll what? Nothing. I spoke a little hasty. All right, Alice. If that's the way the wind blows, I can't whistle against it. I'll get over it. Just give me time. I'll get over it. A week later, Phil Denby was better. He was taken on as a four-deck hand on the westward. He sailed several trips to the Grand Banks for mackerel and back to harbor again. And each time, he and Bart got along very well. A fair wind and a good catch, Alex. No trouble out or back. I wasn't thinking about the weather, Phil. Oh, I am. The wind has shifted. This next trip, I figure we'll run into some rough storms on the way back. I... Oh, you mean me and Bart, huh? Yes. Yeah, there are times he looks at me. How? You know how. After all, I got a good idea about how he feels about you. 
Everybody in town knew he was going with you steady. We never had an understanding. I didn't say you did. Still, uh, Alex, how about me? How do you feel about me? I don't... I, I don't really know, Phil. I know my feelings toward you. I told you before. I love you, Alice. Phil, I, I just can't be sure. Well, why not? You don't love Bart. Or do you? Or are you waiting for some sign? Well, I'm, I'm telling you honestly how I feel. You you wouldn't want me to... <gasps> hey, what's the matter? Oh, it's nothing. All of a sudden, you're pale. Here, well, let me let me feel your forehead. Alice, you've got yourself a fever. You'd better get to bed right away. The next time the Westward sailed for the Grand Bank, Alice Tripp was not on the dock to wave her off. She was in bed with a bad case of pneumonia. And Bill Denby's forecast about the weather came true also. The Westward had no trouble outbound. But on the way back, the seas mounted into a full gale. Encore! Order of course, flat your eyes, Denby! You and your pilots all up on Denmark Reef! The storm continued, pounding away at the hull. As the ship approached landfall, all eyes kept a sharp lookout for the buoy that marked treacherous Dead Man's Reef. And Bill Denby noticed that Bart kept looking at him in a strange way. What's fighting you, Bart? Every time I turn my back, I get the feeling you're looking daggers at me. What's going on inside your head? Bart did not answer. The westward beat its way through the darkness. Then suddenly, only a mile or so off the reef. Run over, Bart! Run over, Bart! There wasn't anything we could do, Mrs. Tripp. Not a thing. Now, don't blame yourself, Bart. He was swept right away. We couldn't even come about to make a search. We'd have been blown right up on the reef. I know, I know. My husband told me. How's Alice? Well, she was getting better. Then yesterday, she had a turn for the worse. Yesterday? Mm Mm-hmm. Just about the time. Yes. About the time you lost Phil Denby overboard. Oh, I hesitate to tell her. Don't. Wait until she's stronger. Storm's still going, isn't it? Aye. Near a full day since we made harbor. But it's still blowing. <coughs> What's that? Sounds like a window banging. That's Alice's room, isn't it? How did a window get open in her room? Standing at a window, the gale still blowing, and you think... He's out there. I hear him. What? Save me, a dead man's reef. I'm on the buoy. Save me. You're out of your head. I can see him. He's clinging to it. He can't hang on much longer. Alice, you're sick. Here. No, no, I won't go to bed. Let go. He's there. I've got to help him. Are you crazy? He's not there. You're just dreaming of the time we picked him up. That boy's just dreaming. No, Bart, no. I... Don't look at me like that. Don't look at me like that, I tell you. I did... I didn't... All right. Wind is going down a bit. I'll go out there. I'll go out there right away. And that's where Phil Denby was. Where he had been before. Somehow, in the storm and wind, he had managed to swim to the buoy... When the rescue boat got to him. I got him. I got him. He's still alive. Steady while I bring him aboard. (laughs) 
You heard me, Alice. I sent out a prayer and you heard me. Yes, Phil, I, I did. Without ever knowing that you were overboard off the westward. And now you're better and you know you love me? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. We'll get married. But, Phil... Yes? When you went overboard, was it an accident or, or did Bart really... Alice, let's not talk about it. He saved me. Let's just leave it at that. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense, a new series of programs with one strict purpose in view, your entertainment. Each week at this time, CBS sets aside 30 minutes to excite you, to mystify you, and on occasion to horrify you with a catalog of the world's great thrillers, dramas from the stage and screen, from fiction and radio, dramas that bring you suspense. This, the second offering of a new series, is a unique one. Certainly, it is one of the very few pieces of suspense literature that somehow manages to tickle your funny bone while busily engaged in... Make no mistake, though, nobody's kidding. CBS presents its adaptation of John Collier's well-known short story, Wet Saturday. Saturday. Never saw it rain harder. I'm Princey, Frederick Princey, just an ordinary family man. I have a son, a daughter, and a wife. I might be out golfing now if it hadn't been for the rain. I'm Mrs. Princey. I plan to drive over to the nurseries this afternoon for some arbiters. The boarders, you know. But... Oh, the whole lot of them make me sick. Yes, I'm George, son and heir. <laughs> I had a date to go punting. Punting. Couldn't find the blasted punt in this weather, so I'm home too. I. I'm Millicent. I was going to play croquet. That's how I happened to have a mallet. Yes, that's the Princey family. We find them at home. Mrs. Princey, Millicent, George sprawled on a couch, Mr. Princey biting on a dry pipe. Their living room is dull and overstuffed. Rain beats at the windows. They are any middle-class family at home on a wet day, except for one small item. As you sit with them in the living room, you can see through the door to the sun porch a pair of men's feet encased in black boots. They look like the feet of a curate. There's a tenseness in the room. The air is charged with excitement, but the feet are 
very still. Don't keep staring at them. Listen to me, all of you. Don't you see? They'd hang her. That's what they do. They'd hang her. Oh, Fred, it's too awful. Awful? It's catastrophic. A supposedly sweet, gentle, intelligent girl, respected, loved by the whole village, doing a thing like this. Think of the publicity, the disgrace. You think I'm going to resign from the bench, the vestry, sell out and live in some foggy hotel abroad? Oh, no, no. No. No, I'll kill myself. I will. I will. Don't be a fool. Any more than you have been, the governor means. Be quiet. Wouldn't be so bad if it were you. Everybody in the village knows you are not responsible. George. Yes? Get off that couch. Sit up on your spine. Uh, you might be of a little use here if you could think. Listen, Governor, this isn't my funeral. Oh, shut up. As long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You've got to stand it, my dear. And keep that hysterical note out of your voice. Do you hear? Yes. We are... <clears throat> we are talking about the weather. Now, George. Yeah? George, if he fell down the old well, say, uh, striking his head several times, what about it, eh? I really don't know, Governor. What about it? Don't be an ass. I'm asking you to think. He'd have had to hit the side several times in 30 or 40 feet and, and at all the correct angles. No. no. No, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. We'll have to go over it all again, Miss. Oh, no, Father. No, no. I couldn't. I couldn't. Millicent, we must go over it all again. Oh. Fred, you're torturing her. Oh, face facts, Mater. With him lying there, there's no use pretending it's a picnic. <laughs> they might hang you, Millicent. Oh, stop that shaking. Stop it here. You must stop it. You must keep your voice quiet. Millicent, we are talking of the weather. Now, we will proceed. Oh, you should have thought of those boots, Millie. <laughs> I'm not moving them. Oh, sit up, George. Stop shuffling your feet. Now, Millicent, look at me. Answer me truthfully, you hear? Answer me. You were in the croquet court. Yes. Who knew you were in love with this wretched curate? <laughs> Who? The whole village. <laughs> They've been sniggering about it at the pub for three years past. Ah, what a filthy mess. Millicent, we continue. You were on the croquet court. Yes. You were putting the croquet set into its box? Yes. It... It was starting to rain. I was carrying the balls and mallets into the sun porch. The box was there. You heard someone enter the garden gate and... Come across the yard? Yes. Could you see who it was? Oh, not at first. I was going into the sun porch. I threw down all the mallets but the red one and turned around. It was with us? Yes. So you called him? Yes. Loudly? Did you call him loudly? Could anyone have heard? No, Father, I'm sure not. I didn't really call him. I... I just spoke his name. He saw me as I went to the door. He just waved his hand and came over. How can I find out from you whether there was anyone about? Whether he could have been seen? I'm sure not, Father. I'm... I'm quite sure. So, you both went into the sun porch? Yes. It was raining hard then. What did he say? He said, Hello, Millie. And excuse his coming in the back way, but... He set out to walk over to Liston. Yes. And he said, passing the park, he seen the house, and suddenly thought of me. And he thought he'd just look in for a moment. He... He had something to tell me. Go on. 
He said he was so happy. He wanted me to share it. He'd heard from the bishop he was to have a vicarage. And it wasn't only that. It meant he could marry. And then he began to stutter and get all confused. And of course, I thought he meant me. Don't tell me what you thought. Tell me exactly what he said, nothing else. Well, well... Oh, oh stop <laughs> crying. It's a luxury you can no longer afford. Tell me what happened. He said, no. He said it, it wasn't me. It's Ella Bragdon Davis. And, and he was sorry and, and all that. Then he went to go. And then? I went mad. He turned his back. I had the red mallet of the croquet set in my hand. I forgot to drop it in the box when he came. I... Did you shout or scream? I mean, as you hit him? No. No, I'm sure I didn't. Did he? Come on, speak up. No, Father. And then? I threw it down. I came straight in here. I went to look for Mother. Oh, God. Oh, poor baby. No. No one will leave the child alone, Fred. Not such a child, Mater. Mm, Millie, I had no idea Keep you had... quiet. I'm thinking. There. You see, George, he probably told people he was going to Liston. Certainly no one knows he came here, for he, he didn't decide until he crossed the park. He might have been attacked in the woods. We must consider every detail. A curate with his head battered in. Don't, Father, don't. A curate, head battered in. Now, who would want to kill with us? Oh, kill with us? Well, I would with pleasure. How do you do, Mrs. Princey? Oh, Captain, Captain Smart. Oh, sit down, pray. Mustn't get up for me, Mrs. Princey. You either, Mrs. <laughs> My word. Just being neighborly on a bad day. I wanted to ask you about those dahlia bulbs, Princey. Took a shortcut on account of the rain and walked right in. Knew you wouldn't mind. Oh, he heard you, Father. <laughs> My dear, we, we, we can all have our little jokes. <laughs> Don't pretend to be shocked. This way, Smollett. Then this chair facing the fireplace. Sit down, Mother. Just to take me in the curtains to the sun porch, dear. It looks so gloomy out there. Might as well shut the rain oh, out. Just, just talking about a little theoretical cure at killing Smolly. <laughs> you know, young people these days like thrillers. Pass on his side. Justifiable pass on his side. If you heard about Ella Bragdon Davis, I shall be most properly laughed at. Why? Why should you be laughed at, Smolly? No, oh, and a shot in that direction myself. <laughs> they half said yes, too. Haven't you heard? She told most people. Now it'll look as if I got turned down for a white rat in a dog collar. Oh, too bad. Oh, fortune of war. Yes, fortune of war. Odd how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> Sit down, Smollett. Millicent, console Captain Smollett with your, your best light conversation. You too, Mother. George and I have something to look at outside. This this rain, you know, but it's bad, very bad. Uh, come, George. Right, old governor. Maybe we'll need raincoats, what? Oh, I don't think so. It'll just make yourself at home, Smollett. Make yourself at home. A cigarette, Captain Smollett? Thank you, thank you. Oh, nasty day to be going out. It's something about the old well, just off the sun porch door, you know. This terrible sodden weather seems to have loosened some of the stones. Oh, too bad. Dash too bad. Spoils the tennis and croquet, I mean, a day like this. Doesn't it, Millie? Doesn't it, Millie? Mm. Oh, yes, the dog. She was practicing out on the croquet court earlier, but, uh, oh, do pull your chair nearer the fire, Captain. It was so damp, we thought it would be cozy to light it. Thank you, I'm quite comfortable. I, uh, I hope you don't feel too bad about Ella David. Can't always win. Can't see, though, what you women see in these bloodless clerics. Oh, I always thought Mr. Withers was that he is a very charming man. Quite agree, but why should anyone want to marry him? You wouldn't want to marry him, would you, Millie? Not now. 
That is, I... I just... Oh. Oh, no. Of course not. Smollett. <laughs> yes. Yes, Princey. Good Lord, man, you... You come in on a fellow suddenly. <laughs> Guess I did. <laughs> oh, don't mind this old double barrel shotgun. Been working on it. Smollett, may I have your attention for a minute? There's something on the sun porch I'd like to show you. Why, yes. Yes, of course. Smollett, George and I went out to see if we could shoot some rats which have been driven out of the old well by the high water. Afraid they might get into the house. Now you must listen to me very carefully. Very carefully or you will be shot by accident. Princey, what's got into you? You heard me ask as you came in, who would kill with us? You also heard Millicent make a comment, an unguarded comment. Well, what of it? Very little. Unless you were to hear that Withers had met a violent end this very afternoon. And that, my dear Smollett, is what you are going to hear. What? Withers? Yes. <laughs> Who killed him? Millicent. Good Lord. Yes, it's a mess. And of course, you would have remembered and guessed. Maybe, yeah. yes, I... Yes, I, I suppose I should. Therefore, you constitute a problem. Why did she kill him? Oh, it's one of those disgusting things. Pitiable, too. She deluded herself that he was in love with her. Good heavens, Billy. Oh, yes, of course, I... I see. He had told her about the Davis girl. I understand. Now, I have no wish, as you will comprehend, that she should be proved either a lunatic or a murderess. I could hardly go on living here after that. Suppose not. On the other hand, you know about it. Yes, I see that makes me a problem. <laughs> You're wondering if I could keep my mouth shut. If I promise... I am wondering if I could believe you. But if I promise... If things went smoothly, yes. But not if there was any sort of suspicion, any questioning. You would be afraid of being an accessory. Why, I don't know. I do. What are we going to do? I... <laughs> I can't see anything else. You, you'd never be fool enough to do me in. You, you can't get rid of two corpses. Oh, I regard it as a better risk than the other. It could be an accident. Or you and Wither could both disappear. There are possibilities in that. Listen, you, you can't. I can, but there may be a way out. There is. Smollett, you gave it to me yourself. I, I did what? You said you would kill with us. You have a motive. Oh, look here, I, I was joking. Of course you saw that. You are always joking. Listen, Smollett, I can't trust you. You must trust me. Else I will kill you now in the next minute. I mean that. You can choose between dying and living. Go on. Now there's the old well just outside the sun porch door. That's where I'm going to put with us. No one outside knows he has come up here this afternoon. No one will ever look there for him unless you tell them. You must give me evidence that you have murdered Withers. I murdered him? Why do you want that? So that I shall be dead sure that you will never open your lips on the subject. I see. What evidence? George, hit him in the face. Sure. George, don't. Ah, keep out of this. Oh, Captain, you should be more careful. Look what your teeth did to my knuckles. Again, George. Okay. Oh, I can't stand uh, it. Uh, I can't stand it. Keep quiet. You women, keep out of this. I'm sorry, Smollett, but there must be traces of a struggle between you and Withers. Then it will not be altogether safe for you to go to the police. But can't you take my word, man? I will when we are finished. George, yes? get the crook him, Alex. Right, Governor. Take your handkerchief to it. In there, on the sun porch floor. Yeah. Yeah, I got it, Governor. There, Captain. There's the weapon. As I told you, Smollett. Now, you'll just grasp the end that mashed Wither's head. I shall shoot you if you don't. But, good Lord, you can't. All right. There. 
That's it. Now deposit it out by the side of the house, out of the rain, of course. No, wait, George. Yeah? First, you'd better pull a few hairs out of his head and put them under the nails of Withers' right hand. Uh, Prince, have you gone mad? Do you know what you're doing? With this gun, yes. Go ahead, George. <laughs> Sorry to muss your hair up, Captain. Oh, shut up, Smollett. There. That's all we need. Now for Withers, we'll fix it right up. Be right with you, Governor. Smollett, you may turn around. Withers is just there in the sun porch. Draw back the curtain. Good Lord, Prince. Yes, messy. But we'll get him fixed up. Now you smell it. You've just got to drag him through the door and dump him in the old well. <laughs> just beyond the door, Captain. I, I won't touch him. I won't. I... All right. Stand aside. Out of range, George. Right. Only one place I want this bullet to go. Father. Father. Keep quiet. My aim's none too good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I... That? I'll... Better, smell it. Much better. Go on now. In here. You'll have to take him outside. By the shoulders ought to do it, Captain. Keep quiet, George. Go on, Smollett. Go on. You've seen dead men before. Drag him. Drag him. I'll just hold the gun here to make sure that everything goes all right. Oh, Martha, come away from the din window, dear. Don't look. But, Captain Smollett, your father is a very resourceful man, Millicent. I'm sure what he's doing is right. But, but, Captain, I can't. I can't stand it. You mustn't question your dear father. I say, are you two still at it? There's enough trouble around here without blubbering. I'm not blubbering, George Pinkley. <laughs> oh, you see, Smollett, everything is perfect. They'll never look in our way. You see how safe it is? I guess it is. Oh, good heavens, man, you're you're dripping wet. Why why didn't you slip your raincoat on? (laughs) Tea ready, my dear? Just a minute, dear. I'll ring for Bridget. Exactly what you need, Smollett. Cup of tea. Best thing in the world to ward off a cold. Sit down, won't you? (laughs) Don't mind getting the chair wet. Cigarette? Help yourself. I stick to my pipe, you know. Funny how... Princey, everything's hot, man. Oh, Bridget, yes. Put the tray in front of me here, on the table. Yes, ma'am. That's it. I say, Captain, you've gone and cut your lip. I I just knocked it. Oh, how dreadful. Here, Bridget. Yes, Give the captain this cup. No, no, thank you. I I, I rather think I'll be running along now, if you don't mind. Why, Captain Smollett, without any tea? If you don't mind, Mrs. Princey, if... If I could just have my raincoat. Oh, I'll get it for you, Captain. Oh, this is very distressing, Smollett, very. Oh, I, I'll be all right presently, I'm sure. Here we are. Now, let me help you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, young man. There. I'd better go out the front way, Smollett. The walk is dry. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Captain. <laughs> Don't worry, old fellow. Don't worry at all. No, no, I... I... Good afternoon. Nothing serious, I imagine. A little rest and he'll be as right as rain. By the way, Millicent, you're not looking any too well. No, uh, not well at all. I'm sure it was that croak he caught. Being outdoors in weather like this is simply foolhardy. The maid is right, Millie. You saw what happened to Captain Smollett. Oh, come along, dear. I shall give you a hot foot bath and put you to bed. And a couple of days in bed and you'll be fine with it. Get plenty of rest, Millicent, and don't worry about a thing. That's the best cure. <sighs> well, I guess I'll have a little rest too, Governor. It's a fine afternoon for a nap. Indeed it is, son. Well, enjoy yourself. I'll see you later. I'll see you all later. Only bring this thing, make me work. Not in the family, but the little girl Your number, please. Oh, would you get me the police station, please? Police station? Right away, sir. Oh, 
Mm-hmm. Police headquarters, Sergeant Yancey speaking. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Prince here of Abbott's Road. I, I believe you know me. Oh, indeed I do, Mr. Prince. Sergeant, a horrible thing has just happened. Quite extraordinary. Murder, in fact. Murder? I'm afraid it looks rather bad for, well, for, for a close friend of ours, unfortunately. We saw him do it. I, I think you'd better send someone over right away. Well, our man should be there right about now, Mr. Prince. I, I beg your pardon? I say, our man should be there now, but Constable Martin has his post right below your house there. Just rang in. Seems Captain Smollett was with him. Uh, Captain Smollett? He reported some rather queer goings on at your place, but I certainly didn't understand it was murder. But just don't touch anything, Mr. Princey, and don't worry. Don't worry at all. No. No, 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 I, I won't, Sergeant. Thank you. Governor! Governor, where are you? I'm, uh, the I'm right here. Stop shouting! Uh, we... we have some visitors, Governor. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I can see that. Well, Constable, g- good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Prince. Eh? And Smollett, I, I say what a, what a remarkable fellow you are, coming back like this, here to reenact the crime. Only the one against me, Prince. Eh? The one against the curate I'll leave to you people. <laughs> Extraordinary sense of humor. Mr. Prince, I just had a look at what's in your well. Not a pretty sight, that. Not pretty at all. Yes, Captain Smollett was thorough, if nothing else. You saw him when he did it, sir, out in the back? No, quite. We were just returning from a walk. Smollett evidently had been laying for the curate, hiding out in those bushes by the road, I imagine. He was never inside this house. Never. And uh, you say, Captain? I say that while I was inside this house, a guest of the family, I was coerced into dragging the curate's body outside and dumping it in the well. Well... There we are. Uh, Not entirely, Constable. Uh, I'll just remove my raincoat. There. And demonstrate how damp I got my clothes when I went outside without it. No. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, Quite. (laughs) He undoubtedly removed his coat at some point between here and your post. I might as well tell you that his weapon, a red crookie mallet, is out by the side of the house. I shouldn't be at all surprised, but that you'd find his fingerprints all over it. All over the end of the mallet, Constable. The end that mashed withers his head. And not the end I'd have had the grasp in order to do the mashing. Governor, <laughs> that's a decent try, Smollett. <laughs> but it won't work. There must be other evidences, Constable. You'll undoubtedly find them when you examine the body. Oh, he means my hair under withers his nails. Well, sir, if you look carefully, I believe you'll find a few of my precious hairs under his son's nails, too. Here, what are you trying to... Constable, this is an utter waste of time. So far as the violent struggle between Smollett and Withers is concerned, Smollett's face speaks for itself. Quite eloquently, I believe. Oh, but no more eloquently than your son's knuckles. As you see, Constable, a fresh abrasion. He did that on my teeth. Or did he? What? I say, or did he? He might have done that on Withers' teeth. (laughs) Oh, I see. I see what you mean, but... But but I didn't. Governor, he said I... Oh, keep still, you nitwit. Let me think. Let me think. As a matter of fact, George, the more I think of it, the more I'm convinced it was your voice I heard. Quite a vigorous quarrel. Something about the curate jilting your sister. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Smollett. Very well, Princey. If your son didn't do it, who did? That's what I'd like to know. How about it, Mr. Princey? Well, that... That is a sticker, all right. (laughs) George, my boy, it looks like you're elected. Elected? What do you mean? I didn't do it. Why, I I had nothing to do... Keep your mouth shut, will you? I won't. I'm not going to take the blame for her. Millie did it. She did it with that mallet, I saw. You could prove that? Prove it? I... I... Yes, her, her fingerprints on the mallet, the handle. Why, George, don't you remember when you made me touch the mallet? Oh. When you picked it up with your handkerchief? No, I... George, I'm sure you wiped that handle clean. Oh, well, I could hardly expect you to remember that if you, if you can't even remember killing the curate. Governor, I... I told you to keep still. But, Governor, you, you, you're not going to turn me over. You, as you're... long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Governor, I... You shouldn't have done it, son. You really shouldn't. No, George, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> I say, Princey, I think I'll have that cup of tea after all. Nothing like it in weather like this. 
Wet Saturday from the short story by John Collier. You have just heard the second in Columbia's new series, a series designed to bring you the best in thrill entertainment. Outstanding dramas from the field of fiction and radio, stage and screen. Dramas of pure... Suspense. This Columbia feature is produced and directed by Charles Vanda, with script by Harold Medford and score by Bernard Herman. Be with us again next week at this same time when we present Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Number four. The Other Now by Mary Leinster. This is your host, Omentor, saying hello for ABC. Look at your watch, uh, but don't take it too seriously. If it's a few seconds after 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, in California, it's three hours earlier. In London, it's two o'clock tomorrow morning. And in Japan, it's almost tomorrow afternoon. What time is it right now on the planet Saturn? A silly question? I wonder. The point is, time is a clock with many faces. Or your time is not necessarily anyone else's. And what we think of as the present is only relative. Let's prove that thesis with a remarkable tale from Galaxy, the science fiction magazine. A most timely story titled, The Other Now. My name is Hal Haynes. I was Jimmy Patterson's best friend, which is why he dared tell me the story you are about to hear. I'm speaking into a recording machine, the tape to be played back only after my death, for reasons that'll become obvious as you listen. First, you've got to understand that Jimmy and Jane Patterson loved each other like no two other people I ever met. That's important to the story. It all began about a year after their marriage. They'd been to a party at my apartment and started home about two in the morning. Darling. Hmm? Nothing. <laughs> well, what's so funny? <laughs> you. The way you always stick out your jaw when you're behind the wheel. 
kind of cute. No, I resent that. A man is attractive, handsome, virile, compelling, but never cute. Darling, you're all those things. And cute. Jimmy, that truck in front of us, what's that long pole sticking out behind it? it looks like a steel girder. Yeah, that's what it is. Oh. See the red flag? Pass that truck, please. What's the matter, huh? I don't like driving behind that thing. It makes me nervous. All right, here we go. Jane, brace yourself. What? The truck's stopping short. Air brakes. I know I can't stop. Jimmy phoned me from the hospital. When I got there, the doctors told me about Jane. Death had been mercifully swift. Jimmy was sitting on a bench in one of the corridors, his face buried in his hands. Jimmy. Jim, it's me. Did they tell you? Yeah. What can I say? Oh, hell, she's gone. She's gone. I know. It happened so fast. A freak accident doesn't make sense. I know. Listen. Anything I can do. One minute she was beside me alive, and the next minute... The hell, why did it have to happen this way? Why couldn't it have been me? The next three months were bad. At first, I feared Jimmy might do something desperate. But soon, the torture of being alive while Jane was dead slacked up until, from an intolerable agony, became a dull, ever-present ache. The worst moment was coming home from work to the empty apartment. So Jimmy arranged always to have the cleaning room there. It was better than nothing. On the night the thing really began, Jimmy came home from work with the usual hopeless ache in his heart. Putting the key in the lock, he thought, if only Jane were there to meet him. If only by some miracle. But there were no miracles, he knew that. He unlocked the front door, opened it, began to walk in. And crashed against the door. It was closed. He just opened it. But it was closed. Jimmy's first impression was that his brain was playing tricks on him. Had he really opened that door? It seemed to him that he had, but in his confused state of mind, he couldn't be absolutely sure. He unlocked the door again. Or was it again? Opened it and walked into the apartment. The cleaning woman, Mrs. Mooney, was in the living room. Hello, Mrs. Mooney. Oh, Mr. Patterson. How do you feel today, sir? Fine, thanks. You didn't sleep again last night, sir? Of course I did. When I came in this afternoon, the bed was still made up, just as I'd left it yesterday. I fell asleep in the armchair. Please stop checking on me, Mrs. Mooney. I don't want you to think of it that way, Mr. Patterson. But you haven't been yourself since the Mrs. Well, what I mean is, I'm worried about you. There's nothing to worry about. Anyone phone while you've been here? Mr. Haynes called. What did he want? Said he hadn't heard from you for a couple of days. Want you to call him back, sir. Thanks, I'll do that. Anything else? Yes. I, I found this carton of cigarettes in the Mrs. desk. Those are Jane's? Yes, sir. Must have overlooked them when I cleaned out the desk. What should I... Throw them out. Oh, no. No, just a second. Put them back in the desk. All right, sir. Before you do that, Mrs. Mooney's, there's uh, something I uh, want to ask you. Did you hear me come in just now? Yes, sir. Well, did you notice if I opened the front door once or, or twice? Why would you open the door twice, sir? I don't know if I did. That's what I'm trying to find out. Did you hear the door open twice? I really couldn't say, Mr. Patterson. Don't think back. Try to remember. Well, you did open it twice, sir. Are you sure? I think so, but well, maybe I just imagined it. You don't look so good, Mr. Patterson. You ought to take a nap before dinner. I'm all right. No, you aren't. I think... Please, Mrs. Mooney, stop fussing over me. Just leave me alone. Jimmy took sleeping pills that night. When he finally drifted off, he dreamed of doors that were open when they should have been shut, and shut when they should have been opened. 
During work the next day, the peculiar incident of the night before was the back of his mind. When he came home that night, he opened the door carefully, wondering if it would be repeated. But it wasn't. He hung up his coat and sat down in the armchair. Wearily, he filled his pipe and struck a match to it. As he dropped the stub of the match into the ashtray, what's this? Cigarette stubs. Jane's brand. Freshly smoked. Mrs. Mooney! Mrs. Mooney! You want me, sir? I certainly do. Mrs. Mooney, who gave you permission to smoke my wife's cigarettes? What's that, sir? What right did you to smoke my wife's cigarettes? But I, I... I didn't do anything of the sort, Mr. Patterson. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, right here in this ashtray are half a dozen of... Per- They're gone. Gone? Cigarette butts, they were in this ashtray a minute ago. Now they've disappeared. Couldn't have been nothing in that tray, sir. I emptied all the ashtrays when I came in. But I saw them. Or did I? What's the matter with me? Or is it me? Was he losing his grip? In a grim sort of way, the thought made Jimmy feel almost cheerful. During the day, work was a godsend. Sometimes he was able to thrust aside for hours the fact that Jane was gone. Now, in the same way, he grappled with the question of his sanity. When Mrs. Mooney left for the evening, he went to the desk where Jane had kept her household accounts. He'd set the whole thing down on paper, examined it methodically, checking all the facts. He was about to do so when he noticed Jane's diary on top of the desk. For a moment, his mind stopped, his brain reeled. Jane's diary, what's it doing here? I thought I'd locked it in the trunk. I know I put it in the trunk. He sat there, staring at the diary. It couldn't be on the desk. He'd locked it in the trunk, but there it was. With trembling fingers, he thumbed through the pages until he reached the last entry. September 26th. September 26th, today's date. But that's impossible. How could this have been written today? Jane's dead. And yet, that's her handwriting. Feeling like a sleepwalker in a nightmare, he began to read the entry. As he scanned the lines, it was as though Jane's voice was in the room. This morning, I went to the cemetery. It was very bad. Three months since the accident. Time doesn't make it any easier to bear. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, I miss you so much. Jane? I'm developing a personal hatred for chance. Chance, luck, whatever it is. It's not an abstraction anymore. It was chance that killed Jimmy. It could have been me instead or neither of us. Standing over Jimmy's grave today, I realized that. But it was almost more than I could stand. She's alive. She wrote this. She thinks I'm the one that's dead. Taking a pen, Jimmy began writing desperately under Jane's entry in the diary. Jane, where are you? I'm not dead. I thought... You were. In heaven's name, where are you? After that, Jimmy's mind went blank. When he came to his senses again, he was sitting in an empty desk. No diary on it, and no pen between his fingers. Where is it? The diary, where is it? Oh, I must have dreamed. Fallen asleep in the chair and dreamed. No. No, it was here. I can swear it was here. I wrote an entry underneath Jane's. Or did I? Am I imagining things? I've got to find out. There must be some way to get to the bottom of this. The next morning, Jimmy bought a small camera with a flashbulb attachment. That night, when he came home from the office, he had the camera ready. He unlocked the door and opened it. 
Then before he walked in, he put out his hand, struck wood. The door was still closed. He stepped back, quickly aimed the camera at the door and snapped the shutter. The glare of the flashball blinded him for a moment. But when he was able to see again, the door was open. That you, Mr. Patterson? Yes, it's me. I thought I heard something. I, uh, I was just taking a picture. A picture? Look, Mrs. Mooney, are you finished with your work? I thought I'd just get the laundry together and take it out with me. Let that go until tomorrow. Good night, Mrs. Mooney. Jimmy waited impatiently until the cleaning woman was gone. Then he moved the film in the camera and put in a new flashbulb. Walking to the desk, he hardly dared to hope the diary would be there again, but there it was. Open, with a ruler across the pages to keep it so. He saw yesterday's entry and his own message. And beyond that was more writing in Jane's hand. Jimmy, darling. When I opened the diary today, I found a message from you. As though you were alive. I... No, that can't be. It's all imaginary wish fulfillment, and I'm crazy to answer you, but please, darling, if I am sane and you are alive somewhere, tell me where you are. With all his being, Jimmy wanted to write his reply, but he was afraid to spend the additional time. He aimed the camera at the diary and pressed the shutter button for the second time. The diary. It disappeared again. Where did it go to? Where did it come from in the first place? What's happening here? Wherever that diary is, that's where Jane is. I've got to find her. That's the story Jimmy told me. I'm a lawyer, trained to take testimony. I mention the fact because I want it understood that I have not colored the story in any way. I've told it exactly as Jimmy told it to me, flatly and baldly, without any attempt to make it sound reasonable. As Jimmy said... Well, that's it, Hal. That's exactly how it all happened. But look here, it's impossible. I don't blame you for feeling that way about it. I'd say the same thing. If I didn't have evidence to the contrary. Evidence? You mean those uh, photographs? That's right. Let me have a look at them. Sure. And there's the first one, the shot of the door. Looks like a double exposure, doesn't it? Mm. You got two doors here, nearly at right angles, both hung from the same door frame. Here's the second shot. If you look close, you may be able to read Jane's handwriting on the page of the diary. Yeah. Jimmy, darling, when I opened the diary today, I found a message from you. As though you were alive. Well, Hal, do you still say it's impossible? Yes. But, Hal... Jim, I'm your friend. You believe that, don't you? Sure, I do, but you can't... Now, there's a perfectly logical explanation for these incidents. Not a pleasant explanation, but the only one that makes any sense. Now, that door opening and closing, Jane's cigarettes in the ashtray, you saw all that because you wanted to see it. You made it up, not consciously, but out of your desperation. Now, you had to believe that somehow, somewhere, Jane is still alive. I do believe that, Hal. But, man, can't you see? You're kidding yourself. If so, how do you explain the photograph of that door? Trick photography. You covered half the film and exposed with the door closed. Then you exposed the other half of the film with the door open. Maybe an expert photographer could do that, but I never even owned a camera until yesterday. Look, you followed directions when you took those shots, didn't you? Yes. Well, then you must have been following directions when you took that trick shot of the door. Okay, okay. But how do you explain the second photograph? The one with Jane's handwriting. Now, you were Jane's lawyer. You'd recognize her handwriting, wouldn't you? I suppose so. Look at that photograph. Isn't that Jane's handwriting? Looks like hers, but it could be a forgery. Forgery? But who would want to forge? You would, Jim. I w That's right. Now, I had a client once, a girl. She accused a man of beating her up. She was absolutely sincere. She really believed it. But her own family admitted that she'd make the marks on herself. And the doctors agreed that she'd unconsciously blotted the memory of doing it out of her mind afterwards. You think I forged all this unconsciously? But what other possibility is there? Remember the accident, Hal. Now, we came up behind that truck. When we skidded into it, the girder could have hit me 
or Jane or neither of us. What does that prove? It was pure chance that Jane was hit. It could have been me. If it had been me, Jane would be living in the apartment. She might very well have written that entry in the diary. Isn't that so? What's the point? The point is this. There are a lot of possible futures. When today was in the future, there were a lot of possible todays. The present moment is only one of any number of presents that might have been. Now, that night before the gooder came to our windshield, there were three possibilities. One in which I was hit, one in which neither one of us was hit, and one in which... Well, you do see what I'm getting at, Hal. Are you really suggesting there's more than one present? That in some other present, Jane is alive and you're the one that's dead? That's it, Hal. Some other dimension in time or space through which Jane and I had managed to communicate. But... But how? Well, it's beyond me, but there must be some scientific explanation. Oh, Jim, you aren't serious. Why not? Before the atomic bomb exploded, all reasonable people said atomic energy was preposterous. Every new discovery, every new step forward is preposterous. Until it happens. <laughs> I couldn't shake Jimmy's argument. After he left, I tried to decide on some course of action. Treat him as insane? But he was my friend. And besides, his delusion wasn't dangerous, not even to himself. I decided to wait for development. One evening, about a, a week later, Jimmy and I had dinner together. He seemed to be in good spirits. He looked over the menu. What are you going to order, Hal? A uh, steak. Me too. Well, what's new, Counselor? Well, I was about to ask you that. Have you, um, have you had any more communication with Jane? Oh, sure, we write each other notes every night. And by the way, I was right, Hal. Jane agrees there is more than one present. Now, in the present I exist in, Jane was killed. But in her present, I'm the one that stayed. Oh, look, let's not get into that again. Well, I don't mind uh, talking about it. Now that I know Jane's alive, life is bearable. Matter of fact, there's only one drawback. Only one drawback, huh? What's that? Well, now that Jane and I have found each other, we'd like to get together. Someday we hope to be able to bridge that gap. Isn't that rather far-fetched? Oh, no. Now sometimes when Jane and I are writing notes to each other, both of us can, can feel the barrier between us wearing thin. Once it seemed to me that we actually touched hands. But I wasn't sure. Jim... Oh, Jim. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Go on with what you were saying. I let him go on, describing what he wrote to Jane and what she wrote to him, and how they both yearned for the time when the barrier between them would disappear and they'd be together again. That continued for several weeks. Then one night as we were sitting in the park, Hal, remember what I told you about the barrier wearing thin? Sure, yeah. Well, Jane and I were pretty close now. I'm almost certain I saw her in the living room last night. Jimmy. Disappeared Listen. before I could get to her. If I could only put my hands on her, if I could touch her just once. Jim, you've got to stop this. What? Do something about these hallucinations. Hold on, Hal. Don't you see they're progressive? It started with seeing notes and cigarette butts, and now you're seeing people. You're trying to tell me I'm losing my mind? No, but I think you ought to have a talk with a psychiatrist. With the proper treatment, those hallucinations would disappear. But if you don't get help... This I thing... don't need any help. There's nothing wrong with me. My contacts with Jane are not hallucinations, and I can prove... Oh. Look, Hal, didn't you have a near accident on the parkway last night? Didn't the car coming around the curve on the wrong side of the road almost smash head on into you? What? Yes, it did. I almost went into the ditch trying to get away from it. How did you know that? Jane told me. Jane? She said that in her time channel, a crash killed Tony Shields. You, you mean Tony Shields was the driver of that other car? That's what Jane says. But it's impossible. There, Jane doesn't lie, Al. Why don't you check with Tony? <laughs> Nope. 
That you, Tony? Yes. This is Hal Haynes. Look, Tony, there's a little thing that's been bothering me. I'd like to ask you about it. Were you driving your car on the parkway last night? Yeah, I was. You sure it was last night? Well, sure, I'm sure. Well, what's up, Hal? Well, did you almost run into another car coming around that curve near Hawthorne? Oh, that's right. Oh, say, Hal, how'd you know that? Hal, are you still on the line? Did you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I heard you. I was the driver of the other car, Tony. Well, I'll be hanged. Talk about a small world. Say, Hal, I owe you an apology. I was on the wrong side of the road. Must have scared you half to death. Yeah. Yeah, you certainly did. I'm sorry, Hal, but uh, there's one thing I don't get. It was pretty dark last night. How'd you recognize me? Well, I uh, wasn't quite sure. That's why I phoned. <laughs> I hung up, feeling dizzy. Jane had told the truth. But Jane was dead. But if she was dead, how could she know about Tony Shields and what happened on the parkway? It made no sense, no sense at all, unless Jane actually existed in some other level or dimension. But that was nonsense. Sheer nonsense. Still, I had to talk to Jimmy. I dialed his number. Phone rang a number of times. I was about to give up when. Hello? Jim, this is Hal. I got to talk to you. Not now, I'm very busy. But this is important. I just spoke to Tony. Please, Hal, hang up. All right, I'm coming over to your place. No, you can't do that. I don't want you here now. Hal, Jane and I are very close. The barrier's getting thin, paper thin. We've touched each other again. When did this happen? Just now, before you phoned. We're hoping, hoping and praying that the time barrier is about to break. But it can't. What would happen if you turned up where she is or if she turned up here? I don't know, but we'd be together and that's all we care about. Oh, but Jim, listen Shut to me. Up. She's, she's here. What? She's come through the barrier. Here in this room. I see her. Jane, is it really you? Who else would it be? Hello, darling. Jane. Jimmy. Jimmy! He'd hung up on me. I dialed his number again. The phone rang and rang. No answer. I gave up and tried to figure it out. That woman's voice I heard over the phone... And I actually heard it. Was it Jane? Or was I becoming affected myself? I had to know. I went to Jimmy's apartment. I rang the bell. Kept ringing and ringing. No one answered. I tried to open the front door. It was locked. The back door was locked, too. The windows were shuttered. There was no way to get in. I tried to phone Jimmy the next morning. No answer. I called his office at noon. He hadn't been there. Finally, I went to the police and talked to Detective Thatcher. Thatcher and a couple of patrolmen went to the apartment. They forced the front door, got into the place, searched it, and found nothing. I was in the living room, smoking a hopeless cigarette, when Thatcher came to me. All right, Mr. Haynes, let's have it. Uh, have what? Now, this is a joke, ain't it? Certainly not. Now, look, mister, you tell us you're worried about your friend. We come here and find every door and window locked from the inside. Nobody here, nothing. Well, what, what's a gag? How did he get out of the apartment and still leave all the door and windows locked from the inside? He didn't disappear into thin air, did he? What could I say? That Jimmy had escaped into the other now. That he was alive on some other level or dimension of existence as yet unknown to us. Thatcher would have taken me straight down to the psychiatric ward. I said nothing. The police dragged ponds and rivers for Jimmy's body. Put out missing person bulletins and so forth. 
Eventually, it was recorded that Jimmy left town. And everybody accepted that obvious explanation. I'm the only one who knows what actually happened to Jimmy Patterson. So I'm setting this down for the record. To be placed in my safe deposit vault and open only after my death. You can't blame me. Would you care to spend the rest of your life in a, a straitjacket? <laughs> That's it. The Other Now by Murray Leinster. Thanks to Galaxy, that wonderful science fiction magazine now in the stand. And next week, another extraordinary tale of tomorrow out of Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine called The Stars Are the Sticks by Theodore Sturgeon. A tingling drama sure to send your imagination spinning out beyond the moon to the man-made planet called Curbstone, the rendezvous of tomorrow's adventurers. This is your host, Omentor, and remember, we've got a date next week, uh, our time. Tales of Tomorrow. Heard in tonight's play were Lawson Zerby as Haynes, Dick York as Jimmy. Raymond Edward Johnson was your host. Music composed and conducted by Bobby Christian. Script adaptation by Michael Sklar. Produced by ABC in association with George Foley. And directed by Clark Andrews. In 2025, neutron bombs wipe out much of the world's drinkable water. For the next several years, survivors exist in deplorable conditions and their rations are dwindling. One woman arises from the camp, determined to improve conditions. Charlotte is ready to do whatever it takes to ensure clean water for her fellow survivors. Water is almighty. Whoever controls the water rules the world. Can Charlotte prevent the power from falling into the wrong hands? Weird Darkness Publishing presents Working for H2O by Sarah Faith. Now available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions on Amazon and at WeirdDarkness.com. like to call Monsterpiece Theater, where we scare enough to send you the very beast. <laughs> this is your old bosom bloody, the Crypt Keeper here, with a twisted tale of terror under the big top. What's that? You're all tied up? Perfect. 
because my gory little story features a mystical magic rope and two circus performers who get hung up on their new act. <laughs> Here, my dear Fright Fiends, is a sojourn to a sickening circus where revenge and rancor rule. So prepare yourself, boils and ghouls, for a nasty little nugget I call This Trick'll Kill Ya. No. What do you mean, no? I just asked you for the money in the register. What don't you understand? Cash register? Money? No. -uh. Herb, stop arguing with the guy. Forget the money. Let's get out of here before somebody comes in the store, stupid. Can, can you believe this guy won't give me... I said, give me the money. Open the damn register and give me the money. Now. No. Uh -oh. What? It's my birthday. You can't say no. This is crazy. Herb, let's get out of here. No. You don't want to give me the... No. <laughs> there. Does that make it clear? Herb, what the hell are you doing? And that's if you're hard of hearing. I said, give me the damn money. What hard of hearing? You blew the guy's face off. You killed him. Let's get out of here. Still not answering? You don't understand a gun? How about a garden shovel that's been marked down for a quick sale, huh? Put that down. Let's get out of here. That's for telling me no. And that's for telling me no the second time. And that's for getting me mad on my birthday. Herb, are you nuts? Give me, get me that shovel. Get in the car. Let's go. Now. On my birthday, Inez. Happy birthday! Get in the car. Wait. What? I heard something. What's that? What? What? Nothing. Let's go. Somebody's in the back room. Hey, you! Come out! There's nobody. Nobody heard us. Nobody's here. Move. Let's get out of here. God, what a mess. Hey, uh, you want some potato chips for the road, Inez? No, I don't want potato chips. Somebody's going to come in here for a newspaper or something. Go, move! All right. Yeah, don't tell me you're hungry later. Move! You don't want any, Inez? No, I don't. Last bite of birthday cupcake. No, I don't want any birthday cupcake. Do. Mm, chocolate. So, if it doesn't bother you, Herb? Me? Nah. Another year older, another year better. Not your birthday, stupid. That convenience store. We were going to get a little cash, move on to Oklahoma, simple and sweet. You murdered that guy. For what? He didn't respect me on my birthday. What was he going to do? Blow out some candles while you were rifling through his cash register? You got to control that temper, Herb. What are we going to do now? Maybe go to Mexico? I don't know. Hey, look, I had a surprise. Another pack of cupcakes. Uh, sure you don't want any? Give me those damn cupcakes. There, end of surprise. Why'd you throw my birthday cupcakes out the window? And you're going to follow them. Shut up. Hey, hey, you want to look at my new garden shovel? I just got to wipe it off here. Shut up. Inez, Inez, pull over. Stop the car. What? What? What's the matter? What is it? There. Don't tell me you want me to drive back to the cupcakes, Herb. Please don't tell me that's why you made me stop. No, the billboard. What billboard? That? It's a circus. It's a traveling circus. The... Staying here in Allegheny County for a month, I don't have my glasses. Otto and Mudgley Circus. Some European guys, so? That's our Mexico. English, Herb, what are you talking about? Instead of going to Mexico, don't you see? We can join the circus. You know, you weren't like this before you went to prison that third time. No, 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 I'm, I'm not kidding. You know, we can say we're a, a circus act, passing through town, looking for a job, and, and, and work at the circus and hide out till things cool down. You can um, uh, uh, ride a horse. I'm allergic. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, so so I, I, I can sort of uh, ride a horse, sort of, and you can sing? Yeah, yeah, sing. You, you said you were in a church choir when you were a kid. Tell him like the Monsignor. Oh, oh, I can see it, yeah. We can say we're um, the, the the galloping martinis from uh, Texas, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they got a lot of guys who ride and sing in Texas, and but the circus guys, they're from uh, France or Russia or somewhere, right? Uh, what the hell are they going to know about Texas? Herbie, that almost makes sense. Oh, come on, Inez. We got nothing to lose, right? Just till it cools down a little, then, then we can take off, and we can go to Watermelon Pit Junction in Oregon. You know, like we planned. Hmm. <laughs> see? 
I'm another year older and another year wiser. Well, the first part anyway. Hey, hey, stop fucking before I smack you again, damn it! And now, ladies and gentlemen, after that um, <clears throat> display of horsemanship by Herbert Marquini, <laughs> we have a um, song by Inez Marquini. Professor, if you please. Hey, watch out. You almost trampled me again. The damn horse isn't steering right. You watch out. Stay out of my way. What is so high in the sky, right over my head? Watch it, Herb. Yellow and blue, blue and blue, and sprinkled with red. Stop it, you damn horse! Stop it! Oh, I can't hold on. No, what's happening? Ah! Get off me, Herb! Quick, quick, say something. That was the two galloping martinis, ladies and gentlemen, the two galloping martinis! Hmm, well, y yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, we're glad to be in mm, Oklahoma, because Allegheny County audiences are the greatest audiences in the world! Yes, indeed! And now, the Otto and Mudgley Circus, direct from Europe, presents our world-famous laugh makers, led by your very own favorite, Otto Der Clown! What? What? Otto, get out there in the ring! Do your act! Go to hell, Jeffrey. You expect me to follow those rotten galloping martinis? They are terrible. They make the ring smell. I will need a gas mask to perform. Oh, oh, here he comes, children. Otto de Clown! Otto, please! You've got to go out there and cheer up that crowd! Oh, I am half owner of the circus also. That's the beast, I idiot. Why did you hire those two imprecise don't give her without asking me? Oh, it is the woman, yeah? Who, Inez? Of course not. Don't be silly. Never heard of anything so preposterous. That's ridiculous. I see. In my country, that is known as a horizontal answer. He's coming up, folks. Otto de Clown. Really? They complicate our very precise business, Jeffrey. Now you will uncomplicate it, yes? I will come to your trailer at precisely eight to have a little review of our very precise business. By then, you will have thrown out those two idiots. Do we understand each other, Herr Ringmaster? All right, Otto, all right. I'll pitch their asses out in the street. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I mean, um, uh, uh, the, the, the pitching asses will be out in a few moments. Uh, pitching things as uh, trained asses are prone to do. After they, uh, oh, God. <laughs> Now we're going to get fired just because our act stinks. Hey, who is it? What the hell do you want? Is it that you are busy? Is this the correct trailer? You are Herb Marquini. May I come in, mister? Can't you see I'm pissed off and I'm redecorating my dressing room? Ah. The spirits have led me to you. I have an offer that may interest you, mister. Well... I don't know. Inez usually handles stuff like that. She says I'm a little too tense. Oh. I sense that she is not present. No. Oh. She's in Mr. Mudgley's trailer talking him into not firing us. Oh. Turn on that small lamp, mister. Direct the light. Toward my face. Like this? Uh, sure. Gaze upon my face, mister. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. Look deeply, deeply into my eyes. Drink of my sensuous lips. What? Sure. Okay, now now what do I do? Oh, oh. Now, yeah, yeah, wow, that's, wow, that, that's something. Listen carefully, mister. 
I was in the audience a small while ago. I viewed your performance. Were you there before or after I fell off the horse? Never mind the horse. As you can see, mister, I carry a wicker basket, and I wear a robe of turquoise and crimson. You selling robes? No, I am not selling robes. Listen to me. In my native country, I am known as a fakir. It is what you Americans call a magician. I will show you something wondrous that can be used in your performance, mister. Oh, good. Inez and me need to stay in the circus for a little while longer. It's uh, professional reasons. Inez will be back in a minute. Forget Inez. Inez who? <laughs> Oh, apparently I've arrived, yes. Oh, oh. thank you for wearing the animal trainer costume, Inez. I've never made love with anyone in a lion suit before, Mr. Mudsley. mm. (laughs) So, um, we'll get that little extension. You'll give us another chance. Oh, yes, yes, indeed, Inez. I'll give the galloping monkeys another chance. (laughs) You know, Mr. Mudgley, mm-hmm. if you count the time you hired me, this is my second, um, visit to your trailer. Oh. Isn't it about time that I... may I call you Jeffrey? Oh, that is very serendipitous, Inez, because I was going to ask you if you wouldn't mind calling me by, um, <clears throat> a special name. It's, uh, sort of private. Uh, something I really don't reveal to everybody. I'm not everybody, Jeffrey. I find it rather, you know, <clears throat> exciting. Ooh, this is fun. And what is your uh, secret name, Jeffrey? Jip Jip. Oh. <laughs> is it now? Mm-hmm. How about this? Jip. Jip. Oh, 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 my, oh, 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 my stars and jobbers. Oh. <laughs> Jeffrey, this is the What? Jeffrey. Oh. oh, it's my husband, Herb. Oh, not unless he speaks German. It's my partner, Otto. It's eight o'clock. We're supposed to review some illegal, I mean, I mean, sensitive business. Uh, um, uh, quick, uh, just put on your shirt. Uh, I'll put on these and, and uh, well, just take your pile of clothes and, mm, get quickly, over here, the window. It's not a long hop. Mm. Yes. Jeffrey, yeah. what? where is uh, this here? One moment, Otto. I'm putting the trash out. Oh, 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 dear me, Inez. I didn't mean that you were, I mean... Don't uh, worry, Jeff. Next time I'm over, I can dress up as a garbage collector. Oh. Geronimo. Mm. Uh, mm. Here, uh, help us. We're ready. Uh, coming, Otto, coming. Uh. There, there we go. Why did you lock the door, Jeffrey? I am um, Otto. Was it locked? Perhaps to surprise me. This is a lovely lion costume. Does it itch? What lion costume? Oh, this lion costume. Oh, well, it's, um, well, you see, Otto, it's, uh... We are to review business. Business? Oh, yes. It's eight o'clock. Right. No, it is 37 seconds after eight o'clock, Jeffrey. Oh. Even though I am dressed as a clown, I am still very precise. I am a precise clown. Yes, Yes. Uh, the most precise, Otto, indeed. We review, yeah? Do you have your list? List? Ah, yes, list. Right here. Pencil? Right, pencil. Sharpened? Um, no. No, 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 no. Here, I have one for you. Oh, thank you, Otto. You are a most precise clown. The most precise, yes. Mm. So, we begin, yeah? Mm-hmm. You have briefed all our employees about the precise coordination for tomorrow night? Yes, each and every one. I did. Check. Check. All the odd seat number tickets for the performance tomorrow have been distributed completely? Friday night seats to a representative of every U.S. crime syndicate. Check. Check. They know what to wear for positive identification? They will be wearing regulation brown suits. Check. Check. Souvenir circus bags are fully loaded? All the drugs have been bagged, Otto. Yes. Check twice. Once for drugs, once for bags. Check drugs, check bags. At 10 o'clock p.m. precisely, they are exchanged with the customers for cash? In the odd number seats. Yes. Check. Check. And then precisely at 7 o'clock a.m. Saturday morning... We divide up the take among our circus family, disband the show, and everyone scurries back to Europe separately. Yeah. Check, check and, and check, check and check. check. Sehr gut. Oh, 
You know, Otto, I keep thinking how fortunate it is that my brother-in-law in Parliament trusted me with this project. Nine, Geoffrey, your brother-in-law is fortunate to have you carry out his project. And how fortunate I am to have you, Otto Der Clown, as a partner this last year. It is not that I am a clown. It is that I am a precise clown. The most precise. Yavol! Oh, oh yeah, yeah, oh, a little to the left, yeah. Hello, Herb. Herb, any reason why you're laying on your stomach in bed with a strange woman kneading your butt? What? Oh, hi, Inez. Inez, meet Wadi. Hello, miss. Oh, well, that explains everything. I won't even ask about all the smashed furniture. Oh, yeah. Oh, to the right, Wadi. Oh, yeah. Wadi saw her act tonight, I know. She's a faker. Fakir. Oh, Mr. yeah, right. Fakir. You know, a magician from India or the Mideast, Finland or somewhere. Uh, visiting a relative here in Oklahoma for a month. That's enough, Wadi. I'm, I'm sitting up. Yes, mister. Uh, so, uh, did you talk to Mr. Mudgley? Yeah, I did. We're not fired. We got a little time. Oh, great. Um... Why are you dressed up like a lion tamer, Ines? What? This? Oh, um, Mr. Mudgley gave it to me as an idea for our act. Yes. Really? Really? Oh, wow. Am I stupid? You know, for a minute, I thought you were going to say because Mr. Mudgley was dressed in a lion costume and you went to bed with him. <laughs> <laughs> Why only you would think of something like that, Herb? <laughs> Tell her that Wadi has a trick to show her that would be good for the act. Wadi has a trick to show you that would be good for the act. What? What was that, Herb? Wadi has a trick to show you that would be good for the act. Oh, does she? Okay, Wadi. While Herb slips into anything a little more comfortable, let's see a trick. By the way, Wadi, have we ever met before? The woman's detention facility in Buffalo, maybe? You look awfully familiar. No, miss. Hmm. Go ahead. Yes, miss. Look inside my basket, miss. Yeah? It's just rope. Just some old rope. Notice. I take this flute from my robes. And now... Ugh, man. I feel like I was asleep for a week. I... What the... What the... What's the rope? It's... It's, it's standing up and... Hey, it, 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 it's... It's like a cobra. Like a... Like a snake. And... What's that tied on the end? A little bell. Yeah, a bell. You watch out! Whoa! Keep that thing away from me. Hey, hey what's going on? It's... Jeez, it, how high is that thing? not attached to the ceiling or anything. So how's it just sticking straight up? Do not touch that all. Yeah. You are, yeah, sure, okay. You don't want to spoil the trick or anything. The power of the spirits run through it. Only I may touch it. Okay. But how do you... Excuse me, miss. Stand aside. Oh, wait a minute. The rope's not attached to anything. Gee, gee, she's climbing it. Hey, you know, Wadi, you sell something like that to some of the guys I know in jail, you make a fortune. Please stand aside again, miss. I am coming down. Ah, and no. Oh, you clap, it all just collapses back in the basket. Oh, you better shut your mouth, her. We have mosquitoes in here. Cute, Wadi. So, what's the secret? There is no secret, miss. It is the spirit of the rope. Hey, do we look that stupid? I mean, what kind of crap is that? Calm down, Herb. It is the rope. See for yourself. The spirits are addressed. Feel it. It... It is just rope. But then you... You gotta have some pole underneath there from the bottom Inspect of the... Inspect the basket. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Huh? Nothing. The spirit of my ancestors dwell in the rope. Yeah, look, who cares? She can do it. What do you think, Inez? This is real suspicious, Herb. You don't get something for nothing. Why did she come to us? Hey, you're right, Inez. I want nothing. The spirits have led me here. She wants nothing. The spirits have led her here. Oh. Oh, well, if you think so, Herb. You said she's in the States for a month. That's just right. I think we got us a partner. How much do you want to join the act, Wadi? And even third? 
In my family, when such a connection is made, we do not take. We make an offering. I bring a bottle of wine as a gift, miss. Wow. We get a partner, we got an alibi, and now we can even get drunk. <laughs> hey, Herb, we're really getting off easy. That's what you think. That's what we think. How was that? Nothing. Nothing. Stars and job posts. My time of arrival has occurred. Yes. Oh, marvelous. Oh. So, uh, he up here. Hmm? You called me. Is it a yes? Oh, yes. Even before Juliana and her trained fleet? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, ah. And what have we here? Chilled wine. Oh. I got it as a gift, but I want to share it with you. Oh. From little old lion tamer me to big. Strong lion, you. Ow. I'm putting the martinis in the starring spot on this Friday show. I want to celebrate the night the three galloping martinis make their grand circus debut. Oh, uh, cheers. Cheers. Hey, I did. You in there? Ah, he's not speaking German. Now it is your husband, Herb. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I was right. The animal trainer costume she was wearing, the snake in the grass, was a lion. What? Um, pardon me, folks. I believe I hear Friedrich the monkey boy calling me outside the trailer. Hey, sit down. Oh. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Who are you planning to share the wine with, Herb? Your private masseuse? Yo, I, I think that means Wadi, right? What's that? Oh, coming, Otto. It's Otto the Clown calling me, folks. I must... Hey, sit down. Oh. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. You're always talking business with my wife. Well, I got a new garden shovel, and now I'm going to give you the business. But I... Oh. Ah. Yeah. Oh. What has happened to the door of the trailer? Look, what have we here? Horizontal sinking seems to lead to triangle results. Oscar Schiff. What is happening? Well, I got to well, I think I quiet. Quiet. Glotten Himmels, this is idiot. I knew you two were trouble when you first came to the circus with this. Jeffrey, what is it? Your face is green. I I don't know, Otto. I I feel uh, very sick. Glotten uh, uh. Himmel, what a time for this. A special audience is in their seats. The acrobats and trainers with their circus bags are ready to start distribution. You two, Marquinis, quickly, go to the tent and prepare for your performance. Quickly! Come in, headquarters. Come in, headquarters. Do you read me? Over. There has been an unforeseen accident, but I am pleased to report our men are placed in the tent in every other seat. One moment, headquarters, an intruder. What do you want now? Uh... Can you hand me my new garden shovel? Schnell Bewegung! Get out of here! What the hell's Wadi? I got a basket and rope. Look at that. Max the elephant's already sitting on that guy's head. It's almost time for us to go out in the ring. Wadi, you'll be here in a minute. She was putting away the massage oil. So, uh, what do you think happened to Mr. Mudgley, uh, getting sick all of a sudden? You idiot! You were hitting him on the head with a garden shovel! Ah, oh, nah. Hitting someone with a garden shovel, that makes him turn black and blue. Mr. Mudgley was definitely turning green, and, uh, being an expert at poisoning people, uh, I'd say it was, uh, uh, poison. Uh, did he eat anything funny or drink anything? The wine from Wadi. Well, both of you drank it, and you look okay. He did, but I didn't. You smashed in the door before I could... Wait a minute. Wadi gave us the wine for you and me to drink. She said it was from her family spirits or something. Do you think she was trying to poison us? We don't even know her. Yeah, but she sure looks like somebody I've seen before. Yeah, me too. Yeah, like in the last few days. Oh, you are still... Hello, Wadi. Shut the tent flap and come in. We go on in a minute. You, you did not drink the wine I have given you. It was also a birthday present for you, Mr. It is a few days late, I'm sorry. How the hell do you know it was his birthday a few days ago? We never told anybody. The convenience store. Herb said it in the convenience store to the clerk. And you look like the clerk Herb shot. 
But how did quick, you find... Quick, quick, cover her eyes. She's a faker. Don't let her look at you. He was my brother. I was visiting him. Oh, she bit me. You see, Inez, I told you I heard somebody hiding in the back of the store. It was her. She saw me shoot the guy and hit him with the shovel and, and even steal those potato chips. My brother's spirit is in the rope now with the rest of my ancestors. I am the last one left. I wanted to poison you to revenge my brother's death. I will still get my revenge, no matter what you do. God, Jesus, you gave such good massages, too. Hey, what are we going to do, Inez? What we usually do, put her in the witness protection program for our protection. Nobody comes back in the wings except the next act going on. That's us. It's nice and isolated. And over here, tools from the work crew. Let her have it with this big hammer. Wham! Then, then... Put a body in this big canvas bag, zip it up, and when you're done, dump it down the sewer. Oh, hey, look, kerosene, my favorite hobby. <laughs> you're brilliant, Herbie. After you're through with her, set a nice cozy fire, make it build for five minutes. I'll be out there in the ring singing the song. The tent flap will be closed. It'll cover any noise. Then you come out on the horse with the basket and the rope. Oh, yeah. We start the act, yell fire, you jump on the horse, and then we make our getaway, just like in Paducah. And now, showtime. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Inez Martini, one half of the Galloping Martinis. <laughs> uh, I guess most of you folks are from a convention because I noticed that half of you are dressed in brown suits and the other half in blue suits. Well, this song is dedicated to you. Music, please. What is up high in the sky, right over my head? Yellow and blue, blue and blue, and sprinkled with red. I bit my hand again, it's bleeding. Rainbow Sophie touches me and tickles my face. Flatter a ton of the sun. Complaining of raining tears me apart. I'm cheering when clearing clouds mark a sunny day start. The beams are found on the ground. I'll hide them away. There's more what do you hear than I thought. Won't let them spill, not until the next rainy day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And now, my partner, the other half of the galloping martinis, Herb Martini. <laughs> it's all done. Here's the basket. Get ready to yell fire. And now... Herb and I will show you something that will amaze and astound you, ladies and gentlemen. The two galloping martinis and their magic rope and basket. And have we got a real hot finish. Here it goes. Give me the flute, Herb. Look, you could have wiped the blood off it. Well, it was dark back there. Can you read me, headquarters? This is Detective Otto Clownfelder. I have infiltrated the tent unnoticed in my clown suit cover. I am hiding in the wings, but I can see the ring clearly. <coughs> ah, this portion of the tent is filling up with smoke from somewhere. God, in Himmel, a, a fire alarm has been set off. But I'm holding my position until it is time to give the signal. Hey, where's that rope going? I have the tent right for me. The other one's headed for me. Unfortunately, my ex-partner, the suspect, Jeffrey Mudgley, has been poisoned. The perpetrator may be one of the circus performers. But I see the syndicate people sitting out there in their brown suits, every odd seat. They are watching the show. And I see our agents in their regulation blue suits seated in every even seat. 
At my signal, they will each turn to their left and make the drug bus. <coughs> no, no, the rope is attacking me. I bet it's the spirit of Wadi. She's inside the rope with her family. Ah, uh, she's talking about holding a grudge. The drug exchange is supposed to happen after this couple finishes their act, so I have to wait. <laughs> You know, I have to say, the galloping martinis got better since the last time I saw them. <laughs> their trick rope, the two ends wrapped around both their necks, is uh, pulled them high up in the air. Now they are both hanging way up high over the center of the ring like strangled meat. Hmm? You know, one thing I learned in my year as an undercover clown. There's no limit to how high you can go in show business when you put a little spirit into it. I'm back. <laughs> I guess that about wraps it up, eh, kiddies? All neatly knotted. <laughs> I should tell you, however, when the police tried to cut the bodies of Inez and Herb down, the rope just collapsed. And when they looked down the sewer, there was no trace of Wadi. So what happened to her bloody dismembered corpse? Maybe she's buried in Frankfurt, and Stuttgart, and Berlin, and Dusseldorf. <laughs> and then again, maybe not. So next time you're passing through a small town, look for her sitting on the ground. She'll be there with her basket and rope. Just be careful, kiddies. Don't let her string you along. <laughs> Until next time, creeps, I'll leave you with this cryptic remark. Death is nature's way of telling you that you partied too hard. And as we like to say around the crypt, you're not getting older, you're getting deader. <laughs> Have a nice die. <laughs> This trick will kill you was written by George Czar, adapted from the story in the EC comic book Tales from the Crypt, originally published by William M. Gaines. This trick will kill you starred Todd Cummings as Herb Martini, Andrew Joffe as Otto Dare Clown, Simon Jones as Jeffrey Mudgley, Rebecca Knight as Inez Martini, and Francesca Rizzo as Wadi. Original score was composed by George Czar and performed by Rick Kniston, Ed Igluski, and Billy Masters. This Trick Will Kill You was produced and directed by George Czar. The crypt is closed. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so bad it's good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Mystery Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. Mystery House. 
Ah, greetings, Thespians. Good evening, Mrs. Grant. Hi, Bobby. I think this story is going to make a good book, and I'll be anxious to know if it fools you people. Oh, a fooler, huh? Right. I think it'll keep you guessing right up to the last scene. You know, Mrs. Glenn, I wonder if it's a good idea to keep people guessing. I don't see why not. Well, I'll bet the listeners right now, for instance, wondering what news the sponsor has for them, and really, I don't think we should keep them guessing any longer. Okay, places, everybody. Set the scene, Tom. Well, well. Another body. Tonight's story opens in the comfortable office of Lieutenant Morse, a police officer of the modern school. A rather timid man is standing before the lieutenant's desk, and Morse isn't paying much attention to him. Reeshover's the name, Lieutenant. R-I-C-H-A-U-V-E-R. Reeshover. I live at 612 North Tennant Lane. Uh, 612 North Tennant Lane. Yeah, I got it. A uh, complaint signed against somebody? Well, no. Not a complaint against anybody I know, I guess. Uh, at least I hope not. You see, I found a body in the front yard. Body in the front yard? You what? Did you say a body? Uh, yes. And I'm pretty sure, uh, at least, I'd be strongly inclined to believe that the girl had been murdered. Murdered? What's the girl's name? I really couldn't say. You see, she's a complete stranger to me, Lieutenant Morris. When did you find a body? Not over a half an hour ago. As soon as I found it, I came right down to the police station as fast as I could. Why didn't you phone? I thought about that. But Elsa, uh, she's my wife. She said, Harlan, my first name's Harlan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go right down there and tell the police about it yourself. See that they come right back here with you. If you phone them, they may be hours getting out here. So, uh, I came. Yeah. Your wife's watching the body. Is she to see that nobody touches it or moves anything? Oh, yes, she's very efficient. Uh -huh. Elsa wouldn't let anybody disturb anything. You can depend on that. Uh -huh. Oh, hello, Gretchen. Now, well, looks like we got a story for you. Hi, Mort. Hey, wait a minute. Not a story about Mr. Reeshover. R-I-C-H-A-U-V-E-R. Reeshover. You mean you know this man, Gretchen? I don't believe I've ever met the young lady. Oh, sure, Richie. Gretchen Talley, feature writer on the Chronicle. You remember me, Richie. Sure you do. Hey, wait a minute. What's this all about, anyway? Why, Richie's a genius, Morris. A genius for finding bodies. He finds more darn bodies. Now, please, Miss Talley, I... The last one was nearly two years ago. He didn't know from nothing, Richie didn't. Just found the body. It was a very distressing thing. I came home from work and stumbled across the body, right across the doorstep. Yes, I, I remember. And the prosecuting attorney tried his best to hook you up with the case, but it was no dice. You don't tell me. Well, uh, just how many bodies have you found, Mr. Richover? Richover. R-I-C-H-A-U-V-E-R. Richover. Yeah, 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 Richover. Now, don't you worry about how I pronounce your name. But uh, it's rather an important thing to me, Lieutenant. Morse. Now, there's a simple name. Nobody could mispronounce that. But Reshover. You've no idea the fantastic ways people can twist it forget around. Forget it, forget it. I ask you a question. Uh, yes. How many bodies have you found altogether? Up to this one or including it? Including it. Why, uh, uh three up to this girl. Uh, four altogether. You've no idea what an irritating thing it is to be forever stumbling into corpses, especially when they've been victims of, uh, a violence. Yes, I'll bet I haven't at that. Now, you don't know anything about this girl that's on your front lawn now, hmm? I can answer that one for you, Morris. He never saw her before in his life. Why, how did you know? Oh, I'm psychic, Richie. And I'm not fussy like the judge was on that last case. You know, I think you people actually suspect me of murder. You don't say. It's rather distressing when a citizen does what he should, makes a report promptly, does his duty, and then... And then, then the nasty old police say to him, I bet you did it. That is irritating, I bet, Richie. How was this Dane killed, one you just found? Why, I really don't know, Lieutenant. I've understood it was best not to move the body, and uh, so I didn't examine anything. Mm -hmm. Well, you know whether she was killed with a bullet or a meat cleaver, don't you? You could tell me that, couldn't you? I'll bet it wasn't a bullet. Why, no. No, I, I don't believe it was. Those people you find, Richie, they never are killed by gunfire, are they? Huh? You should have been around when Richie discovered the other bodies, Morris. The pattern was always the same. You found it when you were coming home from work, Richie? Why, uh, yes. And he'll be able to prove that he was at the office all day, Morris. And the coroner will testify that the victim was murdered at least two or three hours before Richie found the body. See here. I don't have to stand for these insinuations. 
I'm a respectable citizen. You're I... a respectable citizen, all right, Richie. You just have one bad habit. Finding body. <laughs> Really, Lieutenant, this is preposterous. It's not nearly so preposterous as that one man should find four murder victims, Mrs. Richover. Oh, but surely you don't believe, not actually, that Harlan has anything to do with, with any of these murders. Well, it isn't reasonable that one man should find four bodies. Look how many people there are who've never found even one body. Why, Harlan's practically timid. You've no idea how it distresses you when anything like this happens. And if you keep him locked up in that cell, there's no telling what it might do to him. No. Well, I know what I hope it does to him. What? Hope it breaks him down to the point where I'll get a confession. Oh, that would be much simpler than going to work. Actually going out and finding the real killer, wouldn't it? Look, Mrs. Rishower, I don't blame you for standing up for your husband. But the long arm of coincidence just doesn't reach as far as you want me to think it does. Then you, you absolutely refuse to let Holland free? I sure do. In that case, I guess I'd better get him a lawyer. Yeah, I think that'd be an excellent idea, Mrs. Rishover. And if I were you, I'd get a good one. Because Richie's going to need a dandy to get him out of this. Oh, hello, Gretchen. Well, my own private sleuthing party didn't let me much more. No, I didn't think it would. This is Mrs. Rishover, Gretchen. Miss Morris, the chronicle. I remember Miss Morris. I hope nothing pleasant happened to her. Still sore about the write-up I gave you and Richie when you got married? Why wouldn't I be angry? Hey, what's this all about? Why, Richie'd found two bodies before he got married. Elsa's folks brought in a story about the wedding, and there wasn't any mention of the body business. I sort of fixed up the wedding story and gave it a little human interest. You were jealous. You were in love with Holland yourself. You Don't make me laugh, Mrs. Rishover. It's true. Holland told me about how you fawned all over him after the second body was discovered, how you brought things to him while he was in jail, and when he got out, you invited him up to your apartment for dinner. A girl has to eat, hasn't she? Richie was darn good copy, and I wasn't passing up any bets. Here's the picture, Mort. Why? Why, it's a picture of Holland. None other. Well, what were you doing with it? You've no right to have a picture of him. You, I've you... been out showing that picture to everyone who knew Alice Woodson, Mrs. Reshover. That's the murdered girl's name, in case you're confused. Holland finds so many bodies. Really? I flashed that picture on everyone who ever had anything to do with Alice Woodson. I'm trying to find a link. So you're a detective. None of the people who saw the picture showed the faintest recognition. But this has gone on long enough. Sooner or later, I'll find something to connect him with the murdered girl. You must read a great many detective stories. Richie isn't going to get away with it this time. Three times is plenty. This time, he's out. Hello, Lieutenant. Ah, you ready to start talking yet, Mr. Richover? Reshover. R-I-C-H-A-U-V-E-R. Reshover. Yeah, Reshover. Gretchen Pally picked up a clue, Richie. A frail, slender clue that most cops wouldn't even bother to follow. And I think she's going to make something out of it, Richie. You know, you can't kill four people without making one mistake. What did she find? A girl had a ring in her purse, Richie. A cheap little ring with a rhinestone set in it. I... I don't know a thing about it. It's the kind of a ring you can buy at any dime store. And there was one just like it on your keychain. I didn't have any cheap ring with a rhinestone in it. Not on my keychain or anywhere else. Eh? Who are you trying to bluff, Richie? I didn't, and that's the truth. You didn't give the girl that ring and tell her it was an engagement ring? Of course not. I told you and told you that I never saw the girl before in my life. I, I... know, I know. You're sort of used to telling the police that, Richie. They've been kind of easy on you. But when they get tough, you'd be surprised how tough they can be. You know, they electrocute murderers in this state, Richie. You... you get out of here. The actual electrocution isn't so bad, I guess, but uh, it's the getting ready for it. You know, when the barber shaves that spot on your head. You get out of here. You can keep me in this cell, but I don't have to listen to you. I don't have no, to... No, you don't have to listen to me, Richie. I wish you'd think about it. If you don't get out of here, I'll... I'll find another body. Ah, now you're talking, Richie. So if I don't get out, you'll find another body. I've never killed anybody yet, but I'll kill you, so help me. You and that cynical leer on your face. That insolent grin when I tell you the truth, you're driving me crazy. <laughs> You've been nuts for a long time, Richie. What was the idea of killing those babes, huh? Stepping out on Elson, afraid you'd get caught? You... 
I'd like to strangle you. And you might get away with it. You've got away with four murders already. But then again, you might be stretching your luck just a little bit. You might... You... What have you done to me? Listen, Richie. You can't... You can't... Oh, oh dear. I wonder. No pulse beat. Yes, he's dead. Quite dead. I told him he'd get into trouble, but... Suicide. Yes, that's it. He has a gun. You have to be careful. Handkerchief. No fingerprints. Put it in his hand. Like this. And press the finger. So. Help! Somebody help! Hurry! Now I'm done for, I suppose. Still, I wonder... What caused Lieutenant Morse to drop over dead? And was Mr. Risho responsible? Did he murder the other four people whose bodies he found? And can he be convicted? We'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. Meanwhile, here's a brief message from our sponsor. And now, act two of Well, Well, Another Body. The scene is Holland Reeshover's jail cell. His wife and Captain Corlett of the homicide squad are there. And Mr. Reeshover seems to be somewhat bewildered. Lieutenant Morse was trying to force the confession from you, wasn't he, Harlan? Why, uh, yes, yes, he was. Quite nasty. And he waved his gun at you and you got scared and grabbed it from him and you shot him to protect yourself, didn't you? Just a minute, Mrs. Reeshover. Reeshover, Captain. R-I-C-H-A-U-V-E-R. Reeshover. But Mrs. Reeshover. I don't give a hang how you pronounce your name, but your wife can't coach you on a defense. I want to hear what you have to say for yourself. But Harlan needs coaching, Captain Corlett. He's such a timid thing himself, and he'd get all involved. That's the idea, Mrs. Richover. I want him to get involved. But I don't, Captain. I love Harlan and I... You keep quiet for a few minutes. Now, I want you to tell me what happened, Richover. Why, why, it was like, uh, like Elsa said. He, he waved his gun at me and... Hey. Yes, yes, I got frightened. I, I thought he was going to kill me, you see, and yeah, I... Yeah, I see. Listen, Richover, we get awful sore when one of our boys gets killed. Sometimes we kind of lose our tempers. And I think I'm about ready to lose mine right now. But really, Captain... You're a liar, Richover, not even a very good one. I don't know what you mean, Captain. I had the car and I gave Lieutenant Morse the works. As complete an autopsy as ever went through this place. Oh, but really, Captain, you could see the bullet wound in his temple. I don't I see I could why see you... it, too. The police like to get convictions when they think a man's guilty, Mrs. Richover, but they don't frame a guy by bumping themselves off. But Holland's explained to you why he had to shoot Lieutenant Morse. He... Look, lady, the guy was dead when that shot was fired. Dead? But... Oh, but that's silly, isn't it? If he was dead, then why should Holland... Morse died of poisoning. He had a fresh pack of cigarettes in his pocket with only one gone. That one was in his left hand, about two-thirds smoked. Each one of those cigarettes contained enough poison to kill a horse. For heaven's sakes. The way I figure it, Richover gave Morse that package of cigarettes, not figuring he'd light one while he was still in his cell. But, well, that's not right at all, Captain. Morse lit a cigarette and dropped dead right then and there. Richover was panic-stricken because there was another body to chalk up against him. That's why he got out Morse's gun and fixed it up to look like suicide. But it was suicide, Captain Corrett, really. Look. Everything about it was phony. The gun wasn't in the right position in Morse's hand. It wasn't held against his head at a natural angle. And part of the powder burn was on this cement floor. You don't think a man lies down on the cement floor to put a bullet through his head, do you? Uh, uh, no, I, I suppose not. Please, Captain, can't he talk to me alone? Just a minute. Right. Yeah, sure, sure he can. i leave right away. Now, Harlan, it was practically like the captain said, Elsa. No, Harlan, don't be a fool. But I... I have a microphone hidden somewhere in your cell. They're listening to every word you say. Whisper to me so 
nothing could pick up the sound, then I'll figure out a story. You see, I'll tell them what you said to me. Then you must stick to whatever story I make up. Understand? I, uh, yes, I, I understand, Elsa. You're an awful baby in the woods, Harlan. But I love you. Honestly, I do. I'm here on business, Mrs. Reshover. Don't worry that it's a social call. I don't want to speak to you. I imagine you don't. But this has to be done, I guess. You've no right to come barging into my home like this, you know. I just wanted to check something, Mrs. Reshover. What? You smoke, don't you? Why, occasionally, yes, not regularly. Why? Have a package of cigarettes around now? Why, I believe so. But what business of that? Don't bother. I see one in the ashtray that doesn't have the brand name burned off. Oh, very interesting. What are you driving at? The brand name's the same as the kind Lieutenant Morse was smoking when he was killed. Interesting. See here, you surely don't think that you're implicated in any of Richie's murders? Oh, dear, no. But it is funny, isn't it, that you should smoke that same brand? By the way, there was something else I wanted to ask you about. Yes? When Richie found that first body, were you acquainted with him? I... No, I didn't know him at all. I remember when Harlan and I were introduced, they told me he'd found a gangster's body in front of his door, and I, I was fascinated. But that second body, you knew him when that one was found, didn't you? I, yes, it, it upset him terribly, and I was so sorry for him. You knew the second victim, didn't you? Why? No. I'm afraid you're lying about that, Mrs. Reshover. I think you did know the second victim. I said I didn't really, you're being outrageous. I, I think maybe that... you can commit quite a bit. The way I figure it, Richie's finding the first victim was an accident. One of those things that could happen to anyone. But it gave you an idea. There was a certain party you wanted to get rid of. Get out of here, I will stand for you. You killed the second one and arranged things so Richie would find the body. I rather think he suspected, and that's why he married you. He was afraid to do anything different, afraid you'd kill him, too. You can't talk to me this way. You lie about my knowing the man who was murdered. I didn't. You married Harlan Reshover to keep him quiet about you and what you've done. And then you said about trying to get rid of him. Get rid of him? That's rather funny. There's more than one way to get rid of a person. Harlan Reshover had found two murder victims. You reasoned that if he found a third one, he'd be suspected. Which he was. I was frantic when it happened. Oh, you're a third victim. You picked an innocent girl, one with whom you couldn't possibly be connected. Your sole purpose in killing was to convict Richie of murder. That's not so. When it didn't work, you picked a fourth one, another girl. You wanted to be sure this time, so you put a cheap ring in her purse and put a duplicate of it on Richie's keychain. You lie. I never did such a thing. The game's about over, Mrs. Reshover. I found the ten-cent store clerk who sold you those rings. She's identified your picture. Her name's Ann Burkle, and she lives in a rooming house over on Guide Street, 314 Guide Street. She'll swear that she sold you the rings. So instead of sending Richie to the chair, those rings are going to take care of you. But good. Goodbye, Mrs. Reeshover. Just where do you think you're going? I'm going over to the police station to get Captain Corlett. I'm going to take him up to Ann Burkle's room. I don't believe you are, Gretchen. Oh! Where did you get that gun? I've always had it around, Gretchen. I never knew when it might come in handy. What are you going to do to me? That all depends, Gretchen. There's the phone. What? I said, there's the phone. Go ahead and call Captain Corner. What? I said to phone Captain Corner. Tell him to go to 314 Guide Street and question Ann Burkle. I, I... I don't get it. You mean you actually let I me... I mean you'd better call him if you don't want to get a bullet through your pretty head. But I... You know the number. Go ahead. You're going to kill me. That remains to be seen, Gretchen. Go ahead. Captain Corlett, please. Hello, Captain. I'm at Elsa Reshover's, and she's holding a gun against my head, Captain. Get here as fast as you can. Thanks. Hey. Now, you don't dare kill me. You don't dare. 
You thought I'd be afraid to tell him I was here. That you were threatening my life. But I, I did, I. I doubt that very much, Gretchen. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Richover, drop that gun. No, thank you, Captain. I think I'll just go right on holding it, if you don't mind. What? No, no, don't worry. I won't hurt anybody unless it's necessary. What's this all about, anyway? Gretchen Talley was in love with Harvey. Fell in love with him during the course of his trial after he found the first body. She figured that finding a second body would be serious. You lie! I'll talk, Gretchen. She arranged for Holland to find a second body, and then she furnished the alibi for him, when it looked like he was in a tight spot. That was easy enough for her to do. Because she committed the murder. I can check the records on the alibi, I guess. I helped him a little in order to get a story, that's all. Gretchen thought he'd be so grateful to her that he'd marry her. But Harlan was in love with me. And we were married. Even Harlan and I had been married about a year, there was another body, this time a girl. The police hounded him, but his alibi was so perfect they finally had to release him. And then this last one. I went to Lieutenant Morse and told him what I suspected. He began investigating and he had an accident. Well, you lied. You never talked to Lieutenant Morse alone. She was in Lieutenant Morse's office when they checked Harlan's personal effects. She found the finger ring on Harlan's key ring. Nobody else had noticed it. And she said it was a clue she'd like to follow up. How about that, Gretchen? Why, yes. There's been a ring in the girl's purse. Why wouldn't I check a good story? I've never seen a girl she talks about. This Ann Burkle who was supposed to have sold me the ring. But I'll bet if you'll go to her room, you'll find she's been murdered. If she's dead... You killed her. Oh, God, if I know what to believe you. She oh. never intended to convict Harlan. All along, all the murders she committed were supposed to get me out of the picture and get Harlan for her. Maybe we better let Mr. Richover get into this conversation. He doesn't seem near as guilty as he did. <laughs> what did you do with Gretchen Talley, Captain? You're not straight jacket, Mrs. Richover. Stark mad. Is this the stenographer, Captain? Yeah. All set to take it down, Sonny? Sure. Just have him go a little easy, though. I won't hurry. Ready? I, Harlan Reeshover, R-I-C-H-A-U-V-E-R, make this statement of my own free will without any promise of clemency. I have never killed anyone. Miss Talley and I were business partners, and I was completely unaware that she had any romantic attachment for me until the episode of the ring. Okay. The first murder victim I found, I know nothing about. The other three whose bodies I found were killed by three different people whose names I will give. Miss Talley, through her newspaper connections, had gained an acquaintance with numerous underworld characters. They paid us very handsomely to have me find the bodies. That threw suspicion completely away from the real murderers. Yet, there was never any real evidence against me except my being in the right place the right time. Right place, right time. Until the ring business, I had no idea that Gretchen Talley was in love with me. Gretchen Talley had never killed anyone until the Lieutenant Morse and Ann Burkle murders. It was then I realized that she was trying to implicate my wife, trying to get her out of the way. The Lieutenant Morse murder made it apparent that Morse had been on the right track. With this finding of Ann Burkle's body, there remains no alternative but to clear my wife from all suspicion, which I gladly do. Harlan Reeshover. R-I-C-H-A-U-V-E-R. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions for those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm. 
There is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make, and then... Then something very odd happened. Half of Dr. Marlowe came alive, his right side first, his right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead, his right hand twitching while his left hand remained stiff. Half of him came alive. Only half. Theater 5 presents Terror from Beyond. What's that? Did someone... Remember! Try and remember! Sir, you will not remember. Do you understand? When we are gone, it will be gone. As if it had never happened. And you will not remember. But you've got to remember, John! You've got to! The whole future of mankind, of life on Earth, depends on it! You've got to! I sat up in bed, listening. The surf was pounding at the foot of the cliff. But that was all. Had I really heard something or just imagined it? I didn't know. All I knew was I was in a cold sweat... But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. The deaths and... Deaths? But they'd been accidents. Maybe if I went back over it from the beginning... That's right, John! Start back at the beginning! Then maybe you'll remember! And you've got to! You've got to! When was the beginning? When I arrived at the base, I suppose went to the administration building for that first briefing session with Dr. Marlowe and Roy. Oh, it's good to see you again, John. It's good to see you, Doctor. Great to have you aboard, John. Did you mind our doing this? Pulling strings to have you assigned up here for a while? Are you kidding? You said it was something interesting. We think it is. As interesting and important as any space work that's being done anywhere today. I know. We'll be putting a man on the moon in a few years, but if we're to go on from there, one of the things we should know is what we're likely to find. In other words, whether there's intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated leaving the old project. You haven't. <laughs> this is still part of the old project. Uh, remember what our problem was on Bango? Of course. A radio telescope can pick up any message from out there that might be beamed at us, but it's sometimes very difficult to tell precisely where it's coming from. Exactly. Well, we're using a technique here that'll take care of that. A light beam, rather than radio waves. You mean a laser? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we discussed that. We've already hit the moon with a beam no bigger than a pencil, but suppose you do establish a contact, how do you get your feedback, your response? Well, we believe we've solved that problem, uh, theoretically at least. But we needed an electronics specialist to work on it with us. That's why we requested you. When do we start? Right away. Uh, by the way, you're sharing a cottage with Roy. 
Now, why don't you go on down there with him? Drop your luggage, we'll get to work. The work. I remember that. Weeks of it. Finally, the big night. The night of our first test. It was clear and cool. The ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs as if it were waiting. All the stars sharp and clear like signposts on the road to the infinite. Dr. Marlowe at the computer, Roy and I at the center console. T minus two. Check. By the way, Doctor, I meant to ask you before, what made you pick Damus as our first target? Well, it was a few weeks after you left the project. We got a message from there. No. Well, there was some question about it, John. First, as to whether it was really was a coherent message, and second, as to whether it was from Damus. The British got a fix on it, too. And it was on the hydrogen wavelength, the one we always said anyone out there would use. That's true. And even though we never got another one, I thought it was worth exploring further. Of course. But that's fantastic. Yes, it's an exciting prospect. But it's also a rather frightening one. Why do you say that? We're reaching out, John. We're getting close to the secret of matter. The origin of life. The mystery of the universe. Sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble onto something that's too much, too big for us. T minus ten seconds. Check. Power on. Give me a reading, John. Vector nine. Eighteen point two and steady. Time. How long to contact? Three minutes, 28 seconds. We sat there tensely, watching our instruments on the clock. Then... There it is, the feedback. We've done it. The trick now will be to maintain contact. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? It sounds like a pattern. Huh? Listen. Even numbers. Now odd numbers. Great Scott, do you think we've got something? Follow it. Follow it. Start with an even series. We started following the pattern, and we got nothing. We kept at it all night, most of the next day. Still nothing. Wait. The next night, it's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. It was about two in the morning. I padded out along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on. I went in. And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was sitting at the control panel, and he was strange. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. Dr. Marlowe? Dr. Marlowe, what is it? What are you doing? Dr. Marlowe! Then, something very odd happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. And then... What? Oh, oh hello, John. Is uh, anything the matter, Doctor? No. Oh, why should anything... Hey... What am I doing here? Doctor, have you ever walked in your sleep before? Oh, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Rather disturbing dreams, but... John, did you change this beam frequency? No, Doctor. You must have done it in your sleep. Shall I switch it back? No. Cut the power, but leave it. I'd like to look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. Somehow, neither of us mentioned it the next day. We just went on with our work, collecting data, trying for another contact, if it had been a contact. And that night, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. The generators woke me again. I looked at my watch. It was almost three o'clock, and for some reason, I was terrified. The door of Roy's room was open. As I went by, I saw that his bed was empty. Then I was walking along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on again. I looked in through the window. 
Dr. Marlowe was at the panel as he'd been the night before with that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? Is anything wrong? He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. Better get John. He started toward the door. Then, apparently deciding he'd better not leave the generators on, he turned and went toward the master switch. And as he did, Dr. Marlowe moved. His face still dead, expressionless. He got up, took a heavy wrench, and followed Roy. Then, just as Roy put out a hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I saw Roy's body crumple to the floor. I stood there, frozen, unable to move. Dr. Marlowe looked down at him for a moment with no sign of emotion on his face. Then, like a zombie, he went over to the workbench again, picked up an odd assortment of tools, and returned to Roy's body. He bent over him, looking at him as if he were a laboratory specimen. And as I realized what he was going to do, my paralysis left me. I shouted and started for the door, but just before I reached it, I tripped, hit my head, and that was the last I knew. I'm not sure how long I was out, but when I came to, I was lying in front of the door and a dark shape was bending over me. John, what happened? Keep away from me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just now, in the control room, to Roy. What do you mean? I just came up here from my cottage. I had a bad dream, came out to get some air, and I found you lying here. But I tell you, I saw you, and... And what? I must have imagined it, dreamed it, because I thought I saw you kill him. We looked everywhere, but there was no sign of Roy. Then we hurried back to the control building and searched it again. He's not here either, John. No. Must be in my mind. Of course... If it had really happened, there'd be something, if not his body, at least his blood. Where, John? Where would it be? Right here, in front of the master switch. But there's nothing. No. Except that the floor is wet. Looks as if it's been scrubbed. Hey, you're right. John, did you change the beam frequency this way? No, Doctor. You must have done it just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No, no. Tell me what you thought you saw happen tonight, whether you believe it or not. Well, you were sitting at the control panel with your eyes open, but as if you were asleep. Yes. The generators were on, and the beam frequency was set the way it is now. Roy was speaking to you, but you didn't answer him. Then when he started to cut the power, you picked up a wrench and hit him. I hit Roy? But that's not the worst of it. After that, you picked up some tools and bent over him as if... Well, as, as if he were a laboratory animal. Telling you about it now, I know the whole thing's mad. It's impossible. I wonder. You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing in it? In the old project. And in this one. We've been listening for messages from out of space. Trying to determine whether intelligent life exists anywhere in our galaxy. John, if it did exist... What form would it take? Well, it wouldn't necessarily look like us with two arms and legs. Exactly. And... and suppose it existed in a totally different form. In the form of electrical energy. Electrical energy? Why not? Isn't that the way the brain functions? Giving off electromagnetic waves? And what do we know about Deimos? Suppose... Suppose living beings existed there. In the form of complex electrical charges and a channel were suddenly opened between it and the Earth. Our laser beam. Mm. You mean they could travel down and take hold of someone, you, I'm and then... I'm speculating, John. Of course, even if it's true, we don't know if these entities are malevolent, dangerous or not. When they killed, made you kill Roy? Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with their base. As for the rest, well, they'd be very interested in the human body particularly the brain. They'd want to examine it, study it. Do you realize what you're saying, suggesting, Doctor? Intelligences from outer space, another world, 
the taking over of a man's body by forces yes, that we... Yes, John, I know what I'm saying. And while I'm only hypothesizing, I don't really believe it's possible. Do you own a gun? Yes. So happens I do. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, don't hesitate. Shoot. And shoot to kill. I didn't go back to sleep that night. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because it would be then that it would be easiest for them to... No, no, I can't think about it. I won't, even now. I felt a little better in the morning. I went over to have another talk with Dr. Marlowe. But he wasn't at his cottage. He wasn't anywhere on the base. And no one seemed to know where he was. Then I called Colonel Gately at headquarters. No one there knew anything about Dr. Marlowe or Roy. But by that time, something had happened to me. It had all become blurred, like an old nightmare that you know was frightening, but whose details you can't remember. About a week later, the colonel called me and asked me to meet him at the police station in the town nearby. You knew Swanson pretty well, didn't you, Parker? Yes, of course. Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. We'd like you to look at it. Oh, all right. Brace yourself. Here. Good Lord. I... I can't be certain, but... I'm fairly sure it's Roy. How did he die? We'll have to wait for the coroner's report, but my guess is that he fell off the cliff. And Dr. Marlowe? Nothing new on him yet, but if they were together, his body may turn up soon, too. He was a better prophet than he knew, because Dr. Marlowe came back that very night. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep, but the sound of the generators woke me. I took my gun, went to the control building. The lights were on. I opened the door, and there was Dr. Marlowe. He was standing near the console, his face thin and drawn, and his eyes blank. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was speaking through him. It is unfortunate that you awaken, Parker, and even more unfortunate that you came in here. What do you mean, Doctor? Where have you been, and why are you talking so strangely? We have been looking over your planet, studying it and its life, particularly you so-called humans. We have found it very interesting. And now, we are ready to go. Go? Go where? Wait. You said we. Dr. Marlowe, have they... You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Her voice, that horrible voice, broke off. And Dr. Marlowe swayed as if he were about to fall. I grabbed him, held on to him. And then his eyes changed, came alive. And when he spoke again, it was with his own voice. John, John for heaven's sake, help me. What? They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain, John. And now they're going to take me with them. Take you back to where they come from, not my body. They're not interested in that, but the essential me. And in heaven's name, shoot, John, shoot me. And now we are ready. Look here at his eyes. Look closely. Yes, like that. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you will not remember what has happened. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday, we may come back. I stood there, frozen, holding Marlowe. Suddenly, he broke my grip, pushed me away. Walking stiffly and mechanically, he went to the door, 
opened it, and went out along the duck boards to the edge of the cliff. Then, without hesitating, he stepped over the edge and disappeared. Now do you remember, John? It's all true! They exist! And they've got me here! Not only that, but they may return to Earth again for others! And... John, they're coming back now! They're coming! Do something! When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. I remember some of what I'd written. But other parts, like Roy's murder and Dr. Marlowe's death, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about that. In any case, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I was mad. There's only one thing to do. Tear it up. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Theater 5 has presented Terror from Beyond, written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Robert Dryden, Ralph Camargo, and Gilbert Mack. Audio engineers, Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians, Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music composed by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. This is Fred Foy speaking. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. I have received word of a strange invention. What it can do will amaze science and strike terror to the world. Two thousand plus science fiction adventures from the world of tomorrow, the years beyond 2000 A.D. Two thousand plus present the insect. Oh, it's wonderful news, darling. It means I'll probably get that research appointment at the university. Oh, I can hardly believe it, George. Oh, here's the telegram from the Dean of Science himself. I'll take the jet plane in about two hours and be there in plenty of time for my meeting this afternoon. I know. 
I'll get a bottle of champagne and we'll celebrate a dinner tonight. Well, that's nice, but <laughs> I'm not sure I'll be home for dinner. Oh? The meeting may go on. Maybe I'll have to stay overnight, take the plane back in the morning. Well, then we'll have champagne for breakfast. Well, let's not hope too much. Hey, 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 I I've got to gather my papers and things while I'm going to get to the airport in time. You'd better help me. In the lavatory? Oh, now, look. The wife of a budding scientific genius shouldn't act like that. But, George, I'm frightened when I go in there. Nonsense. They won't hurt you. Oh, no, I can't stand in fix. That's why I stay out of your life. I've got to have help with these papers. What do you want me to do, cancel the meeting because my wife is afraid of the work I do? Oh, I'm sorry, darling. It just... All right, all right. I'll try to do it myself. But don't be angry, George. If they were ordinary insects, tiny ones were... Maybe it would be different. Even with what I've done to them, they're not so big. So I've taken a spider, a house fly, and a wasp, and by means of my growth ray, I've made them larger. The spider still isn't any bigger than my fist. The house fly is about as large as a pack of cigarettes. The wasp no bigger than the golf ball. They're not giants. But they look so, so horrible when they're even that big. Easier to observe and study. That's why the university is interested in my work. With a long-term appointment and a grant to amplify the growth ray, maybe I can really increase the size of the insect. Imagine a fly as big as a horse. That would be some horse fly. Hey, that's a joke. Oh, that, George. I'll help you. It's only the papers we're packing. You won't have to go near the insect cages. <laughs> Now, uh, hand me those uh, poisonous insects. And that one there. Oh, uh, sit in? Right. And do you, do you have any poisonous ones in here now? Only Sam, the spider. He's in the glass cage by those books. I don't want to look. Maybe if you'd look, you wouldn't have such ridiculous ideas. Sam is a nice guy. He just squats and stares. Looks like a wise old man. Oh, if I looked, I'd get sick. All those legs don't. Here's a wolf. Okay, okay. Now the notebook, please. Hey, 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 be careful. Why? The wolf, what's the matter? That machine is very delicate. You almost touched it. Oh, the growth ray? Uh-huh. I don't want that running while I'm gone. Well, don't worry. I can't wait to get out of here. Oh, uh, let's see now. We got everything. Mm, yep. Well, that does it. Come on. After you, me terror-stricken beauty... You know, I hope when we get to the university, if I get the appointment, you'll keep your disgust of insects to yourself. A wife is supposed to build up her husband's work. Faculty wives do that all the time. George, don't argue with me now. I just can't help the way I feel. Sam should really be fed while I'm gone. Stop it! I'm not going in there. All right. All right. What about Pete the housefly? He's not poisonous. You feed your insects when you get home. Now, hurry up. George will be late. Sure. Well, goodbye. Oh, George, I, I don't want you to leave when you're annoyed like that. I'm sorry, darling. I really love you. But I love my insects, too. Hello, Mr. Martin. Here are the groceries you ordered. Oh, hello, Bill. Right in here. Okay. On the table? Uh, -huh, please. Oh, well, I hope the oranges are better this time than they were last. Oh, Mr. Kinkelheim was said to tell you that these oranges are swell. Well, I'll know when I squeeze them for breakfast. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bill. Oh, well, is uh, Mr. Martin home? Mr. Martin? Uh, no, he isn't, Bill. Why? Well, he was going to show me his bugs. Oh, if you don't want to look at them... But they're dreadful. I find them very interesting. Mr. Martin said he'd take me into his lab today. That's why I delivered your order first. I was anxious to see them. Oh, Mr. Martin was called away suddenly. He got a telegram and had to leave almost at once. But he'll be home tomorrow. Tomorrow I've got to work at the other store, the one on North Street. Well, in a few days, then. And the bugs will still be here, Bill. Mrs. Martin, would it be too much trouble if you let me peek at them? I never go into Mr. Martin's laboratory. I won't hurt anything. Just peek. I was kind of looking forward to oh, seeing them. Oh, it's a horrid and... place, Bill, that laboratory. Uh, you wait till Mr. Martin gets home. 
Sure, Mrs. Martin, if you say so. Well, <laughs> don't look so glum. What you men see in those revolting creatures, I'll never know. They're scary. They're so big. I feel funny when I look at them. Then Mr. Martin explains about science and stuff, and it's really interesting. Would you like to be a scientist, Bill? I sure would. <laughs> well, I suppose I ought to encourage it. I, I won't take you in, but you can peek. You know where the door is. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Martin. Thanks very much. But don't touch anything. I won't. Oh, then it's a piece of thing she's away. Mrs. Martin, help! 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 Bill! Bill, what's the matter? Help! Help! Oh, no. No! I... I saw it before. It wasn't here the last time. I don't know. At least six feet high. What is it? Look at the eyes. Feelers out in front, waving. Wings. It's got wings. It can fly at us. Kill us. Eat us. Get out of here. We must. We must get out of here. Keep your eyes on it. It looks like a like a moth. A giant moth. Watch it. If it flies to open it. Oh, 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 oh. You're about to tip it to open it. Quick, open it. I, I can't. It's locked. Where's the key? In the old room. We, we can't get out. We can't get out. I'm looking at it. Oh, don't cry, Mrs. Martin. It isn't doing anything. It's just sitting there, fanning its wings. Oh, Bill. Bill, what should we do? I don't know. Let, let's move in the corner by that chair. We can crouch down behind it. Down. We'll just sit here and watch it. Now, Mr. Martin, I'm very interested in your growth ray. As dean of science, I want to be certain that this university encourages brilliant young scholars who are experimenting in new fields of research. I understand. At sir. the same time, I must be satisfied that the research will be of fundamental value. Yes, sir. Now, suppose you talk for a while. Tell me about your work. Well, I have always been interested in the effect of environment on organisms. I narrow the environmental factors to universal conditions applicable to all organisms. Mm -hmm. For example, sir, uh, air, temperature, humidity, light, and so forth. And then I approach each of these conditions from the point of view of its specific effects on organisms. I discovered that the presence or absence of light gave me the widest variance of the action. Oh, excuse me. In what way the widest variance? In the effect uh, on physical growth, change, adaptation. Oh, I see. You see, sir, because light is a general term, I broke its definition down into all known rays, infrared, ultraviolet, so forth, and studied reactions of organisms to those rays in every conceivable combination. Now, after two years, I evolved the theory that if certain rays could be combined electronically and concentrated on living organisms for specified periods of time, their growth would be greatly stimulated. And you have constructed such a machine? Yes, I have. The Electrodyna spectrum, the growth ray machine. Uh, what have you accomplished with it so far? I've multiplied the growth of certain insects many times. My present machine is small and homemade, and its power is not too great. But so far, I've increased the size of a fly to that of a pack of cigarettes, mm. the size of a spider to that of my fist. Of what kind of spider? A tarantula. Well, that's a very dangerous and poisonous insect to work with. Well, being a tropical spider, it might be more receptive to light. 
Its size has tripled. Tell me, Mr. Martin, what is the optimum increase in size that you've so far obtained? About eight times with the fly. The size increase uh, varies with the insects. There's a lot of research yet to be done. Yeah, so I can see. Your work certainly excites the imagination. Think of your having the kind of equipment that will permit a 20, 50, 100, or even a thousand-fold increase in an insect's size. Imagine an insect large enough to attack and devour a human being. Imagine this university needing lion cages to contain its giant insects. Well, there's no limit to what new things we could learn about all manner of organisms with the growth rate. Not, not just insects. Yes, that's right. Mr. Martin, I'd like you to stay on another few hours so that we can talk some more. I'd be very happy. Uh, Perhaps you'd like to phone your wife that you'll be a bit late? Thank you, sir. You can use the phone in the other office. And Mr. Martin? Yes. When she asks you how everything's going, you tell her that it's going just fine. It's still sitting there, looking at us. Horrid thing I ever seen. Six feet high. Those giant wings. How does it get here, Mrs. Martin? Somehow the growth ray must have begun working. It gives off a slight glow. The moth must have seen it. Flown toward it. It must have seen us. Those eyes. They're big as dinner plates. Maybe it's waiting. Then it will come toward us. It'll try to kill us. Then it's... Don't, Bill. Don't say that. Crouch down, Lord. This chair protects us. We've got to get out of here. The door's locked, but isn't there some other way out? Only the window. Behind the moth. Yes, the window locked. I can't see. The shade is drawn. Yes. Yes, the window is locked. Gosh, if it would only fly to the other corner of the room... Then what would you do? Maybe I could run to the window, pull up the shade, unlock the window, get out and get help. Just leave me alone with that horribly monstrous creature. Oh, no, but... What do we do? I don't know. Where will Mr. Martin come home? This afternoon, tonight, maybe not until tomorrow. (laughs) The phone. Maybe that's Mr. Martin calling. Yes. When you don't answer, maybe he'll come home. No. No, he'll think I'm out shopping or or visiting. Mrs. Martin, look. The man... It stopped moving its wings. It's looking right at us. At this corner. I'll bet it hears the telephone. It scares him. Do you think that might have... That, that might be George calling him? Why doesn't he realize something has happened? Why doesn't he call the neighbors or the police? Why doesn't he come home? Mrs. Martin, I think it's going to fly. What do we do? I don't know. It'll kill us. If, if it heard the phone, it'll hear us. When it flies... Crouch down, Bill. Get as much protection from the chair as possible. And scream. Yell. Anything to make noise. Okay. Okay, Mrs. Martin. Oh, the way it just stares. Maybe. Maybe it won't fly. It won't fly. The phone has stopped ringing. Yes, Bill. Yes. Let's be quiet. Like a nightmare being here. Oh, George, darling, you know I hated these insects. Yet you built a laboratory in our home. Oh, a place with a room of terror. Why am I here? Why did things happen to trap me here? Was it because I hated George's work? Was it because I refused to help him with these repulsive creatures? I see them all. His body's like a worm. Quivering. Rapidly. Gray. Dirty. And those eyes. Those eyes staring. Knowing I'm here. <coughs> What are you going to do? It's fine now. Same again. Make noise. Uh, why do you want me? That's the wall, the ceiling, the fire, the window. 
This way, it's the widow's shape. This way, it happened. The sunlight's coming in. He's flying blindly. Crazy. What is that? Bill. Bill, the glass cage. The glass cage with the spider. The poison, the spider. I see it. Scouting across the floor. Look at there, by the sofa. The giant mouth is sitting on the bookshelf. And on the floor. Like a fuzzy ball of death. The spider. The tarantula. <laughs> Mr. Martin, I am delighted to see you. The dean phoned and said you were coming over. I think I am the last member of the faculty committee he wants you to see. Oh, sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you, Professor Buckley. Yes, I have been going all afternoon from one appointment to the other. And all of us are happy to talk with you. The dean is quite excited about your research, you know. Yes, I'm very pleased about that. Uh, Professor Buckley, I hope you won't think me rude at the beginning of our meeting, but I wonder if I might use your phone. Why, of course, Mr. Martin, is something wrong? No, I don't think so, but I phoned my wife several times to tell her I was staying on all afternoon, and uh, there's been no answer. Oh, I'm but... sure there's nothing wrong, but it means call the phone is right there. Thank you. Number, please. Alert view 84572, and uh, reverse the charges, please. Thank you. Well, there doesn't seem to be any answer. Oh, well, let it ring a few more times. Sorry, sir, there is no answer. Shall I keep trying? Uh, yes, operator, please keep trying. I'll call you, sir. Thank you. I can't understand it. It's not like Betty to be away so long. <laughs> Still there, Mrs. Martin. Yeah. Still there. Saw the spider last week. As big as Mr. Martin's fist. I looked into the glass cage. I could see the hair on its legs. Like bristles. And Mr. Martin showed me its mouth. Where it bites and kills with the poison. Stop it, Bill! Stop it! For heaven's sake! Oh. I'm sorry. Smart well, I, I can't stop looking at them. They don't like the sunlight. That's why they're on the sofa. But the whole room is flooded with sunlight since the shade went up. I in this corner behind this chair. It doesn't give us the protection we need. Why? The moth is too big to get at us here. But the spider, it can scurry on the rock under the chair. I'll take off my shoes. Something to hit it with if it comes. There. Now you take one of them. Look, its wings are fluttering again. It's going to fly again. But let's not scream. It might scare the spider. Can they hear too? I don't know. Here it comes. <laughs> the picture on the wall. He's not to die. Oh, the spider. The spider. Where is he? I don't know. Don't worry. The one in the room. The mouth. It's still flying. The spider. Maybe it's near us. There is still no answer, sir. Shall I keep trying? I don't know. I'll call you back. Ask for operator 34, sir. Thank you. No answer yet? No, sir. Of course, I did tell Betty that I might be late or even stay overnight. She may have gone to her mother's. It was a real pleasure finding a young man who cares that much for his wife. I suppose Mrs. Martin feels the same way about you. Oh, Betty's wonderful. Yes, I'm sure she is. After all, not many women would approve of their husbands inventing machines that make insects larger. You've got a rare wife, Mr. Martin, one who doesn't object to giant insects in the house. Keep 
Keep the shoe tight in your hand, Bill. If you see the spider, hit it. It's hard. Yes, ma'am. I will. I can't stand it much longer. My, my hands are trembling. I'm cold all over. Me too, Mrs. Martin. I think I'm getting to think. Oh, you mustn't, Bill. I could have a drink of water. The moth is acting strangely. See? Yeah. Its feelers are kind of limp. And its body. Oh, oh that disgusting worm like body. Landy all of a sudden. Droopy. Its eyes. They look different, too. I don't know why, but somehow the key has. Has to arrive. Huh? What's the matter? Spider! 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 Oh, oh, no. No. It was only the hem of your skirt touching my leg. I thought it was the spider. Oh, 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 oh Mary. Mary, what's going to happen to us? God, Mrs. Martin, don't cry. Please don't cry. Well, Mr. Martin, are the terms satisfactory to you? Oh, yes, sir. Very much so. Thank you, sir. It's going to be a great pleasure having you at the university. And I know that you'll find your association with us a real incentive to carrying on your work with a growth rate. I'm sure of that. I'll do my very best to be a credit to the university and to scientific research. Now, my boy, it's time for you to leave if you want to catch the 610 and be home to tell your wife. You just get home and you'll find that there's an explanation for why she didn't answer the phone all day. I'm sure you're right. Thank you again, Dean. Thank you very much. Feel better now, Mrs. Martin? I guess so, Bill. I'm all cried out. I haven't a tear left. Look, Mrs. Martin, I'm going to try to reach the window. The, the window? The moth is back on the couch. I think I can make a run for the window once I push the chair aside a little bit. But he might attack you. Or me? Well, maybe he won't. But, but he really will. The moth is so big. Six feet high. Bill, what would happen to either of us if he did attack? I would be eaten alive. Do they, do they have tea? Could it really chill us? Well, moths eat all sorts of things. George would know exactly. I had a whole group of claws rowing last year. They should say so terribly, Daisy. I'm biting. Oh. Bill, I, I don't know what to say. I'm going to try it. Now crouch down. I'll, I'll push the chair around a little, squeeze by between the chair and the wall, and make a dash for the window. Now, there. The chair's pushed aside. Now, give me my shoes. Okay, Mrs. Hart. Here I go. I'm here. I'll try to unlock the window. Look out! The mom is staring at you! Get away! Get away, you! Get away! Bill! 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 It's attacking me! It's trying to kill me! Ah! Bill! Bill! Are you all right? Bill, answer me! Answer me! <laughs> That's right. Ah, oh, that's better. Where can Betty have gone? Betty! Betty, are you here? No, I'm... No. Betty, where are you? In the laboratory. Oh, Good Lord. Locked. It's locked. Where's the key? Here. Oh, oh, my darling. George. George, it was awesome. Who's that? Betty, for heaven's sake. It's Bill. Bill, the grocery boy. He's killed. Killed by that. that, that Look at that moth. <laughs> I can't believe it. It's dead. Bill. 
Bell. Bell. Uh, what? Oh, Mr. Mark. Mr. Mark, you'll find it. The glass book is on the floor. Let's get out of here fast. All right, sit down, Bell. For heaven's sake, what happened? Yes, sit down, darling. I'll get you a drink. Here you are. Thank you. Now, now tell me. The, the laboratory door snapped behind us. The giant moth was there. He knocked over the gas cage with the spider. We thought we'd die. And I thought, I thought Bill was dead. I'll find the spider and kill it. But as for the moth, darling, despite its size, you had nothing to fear. What? Well, you see, darling, the adult moth doesn't eat. It has no mouth. Nothing to attack or kill with. Despite its size, Trichophaga tapicella, the clothes moth, is utterly harmless. You mean it? You, you mean we could have just shoot it away and, and opened the window? Of course, dear. The reason it's dead and why you could have waited without worrying is that a moth cannot live more than six hours in sunlight. You see, dear, all this horror was unnecessary. <laughs> Next week, a strange drama of a silver rocket and an unseen visitor from space. Be sure to listen to 2000 Plus, radio's different series. 2000 Plus is produced by Dreyer and Winolson Productions, Incorporated. In today's cast, Joan Shea portrayed Betty, Larry Robinson was Bill, Ralph Bell was George, and Bill Gippis was the dean. Music composed and played by Milton Kay, sound Al April and George Cooney, engineer Bob Albrecht, this is Ken Marvin speaking. This program came from New York. In ancient times, they thought that the rising of the dog star Sirius was responsible for the sultry weather of midsummer. Sirius or not, no one needs to be told that these are dog days, and every sportsman knows it's perfect weather for just plain fishing. So for the latest tips and information on how to catch everything from minnows to muskies, listen to Mutual's Rod and Gun Club of the Air every Thursday. You'll hear moderator Milo Bolton with his panel of sports experts in an informal sports session you won't want to miss. Listen to Rod and Gun Club of the Air every Thursday. You'll enjoy it. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. From Hollywood, Miss Laureen Tuttle in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected. Romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected.
But first, a word from your announcer. Now, Lorene Tuttle, outstanding radio and screen star in Finale, a drama of the unexpected. I couldn't wait any longer. I delayed too much already, putting the terrible moment off from day to day. And now I couldn't put it off anymore. If I did, Kent might learn the truth. Someone might tell him. I thought it my duty to inform you, Mr. Fairfax. What? Mona's never mentioned it? No, the idea was unbearable. I'd have to do it myself, and soon. That afternoon was cold and black and unfriendly. I could feel the darkness closing in. Night was coming early. It pressed against my face, tighter and tighter, until I wanted to scream. Julie! Julie, come here! Hurry! Yes, yes, mademoiselle. Is something wrong? No, no, of course not. I'm quite all right. Why shouldn't I be all right? I thought I heard you call. What? Oh, oh, yes, I, I, I've i decided to change my dress. I want to wear black. Black, mademoiselle? Yes, my black crepe. But don't argue with me, Julie. Do what I tell you. But I, I only thought that since you and Mr. Fairfax were going for a drive... I've changed my mind, that's all. I've just changed my mind. Oh, do I have to explain everything to you? Oh, why won't people ever let me live my own life? You're going to tell him today, aren't you? That's really none of your business, Julie. You've decided to tell him today? All right, so I have. There's no point in putting it off. You won't be cruel, will you, mademoiselle? I am never cruel, Julie. Unnecessarily. But I was going to be cruel. You can't get rid of a man who's loved you for years without hurting him. And Kent would be hurt. What difference did it make? I couldn't help it. It would be easier to hurt him, much easier, if if I had the strength to do it. Where's my gold comb, Julie? Have you mislaid it again? I'm sure it's on the dressing table, mademoiselle. Yes, here it is. Oh. Oh, I didn't see it. Shall I brush your hair? I'm quite capable of doing it myself. Of course. When I need something, I'll ask for it, Julie. Yes, mademoiselle. I'm very sorry. Well, what are you waiting for? Mademoiselle... About the young man this afternoon. What about him? He's very much in love with you, you know. I don't need you to tell me that. But perhaps you should explain to I've him. already decided exactly what I'm going to do. Stop prompting me, Julie. For heaven's sake, let me live my own life. I've already decided exactly what I'm going to do. I finished putting on my makeup. But my hands were trembling. And I wasn't sure if I'd done it right. Perhaps I'd added a little too much rouge. I didn't know why, but I was nervous. Terribly nervous. I'd planned the whole thing so carefully. Nothing could go wrong. And yet I... I was frightened. What time is it, Julie? A quarter of four, mademoiselle. Oh. Now I want to be sure that everything is quite ready. Let's see. He'll come through the door bringing a box of candy or something equally useful. He'll set it on the little table, and then... Should I let him kiss me, Julie? I wouldn't know, mademoiselle. Now, don't be difficult, please. When I ask you something, answer. Then I should say it doesn't matter whether you let him kiss you or not. It makes a great deal of difference, Julie. I think I will let him kiss me. And then... Then I'll turn away and sit over here across the room, where you can't see me too clearly. Uh, Draw the blinds, Julie. I don't want any daylight in the room, 
It isn't flattering, and I always feel more comfortable in the dark. It's almost dark now, mademoiselle. Close the blinds. There. That's much better. Now, shall I bring up the subject abruptly or work the conversation gradually around until I'm ready to tell him? To be abrupt sounds fairer. I suppose you're right. Get it over quickly. He won't understand at first, and, and then I'll get up, face the windows, and keeping my back to him, make the whole thing quite clear. It's always much more convincing when you don't look at a man in the face. <laughs> I wonder why. I have no idea, mademoiselle. You think he'll be very angry, Julie? Probably. But he'll get over it. Oh, yes. You needn't be quite so positive. I'm sorry. <laughs> After it's over, he'll go storming out of the apartment, forgetting his hat. He always does when he's upset. <laughs> I wonder if he'll come back for it this time. I hope not. And then perhaps I'll keep the hat as a reminder of, of past love. You know, mademoiselle, it won't happen just the way you plan it. Oh, won't it, Julie? We'll see. At this moment, he's in the elevator riding up to this floor. The car stops, he steps out, mumbles something to the operator, and strides up the hall. Right now, he's taking off his hat and straightening his tie. And just a second, he'll ring the buzzer. Well, open the door, Julie. I'm quite ready for him. Quite ready. brought you some candy, Mona. Thank you, darling. I'll leave it here on the table. Oh, all right. Well, don't I get a kiss? Yes, of course you get a kiss. <laughs> That's more like it. We're going for a drive, remember? Yes. But first, let's sit here for a moment and talk. What about? Well, I'll be very frank, and I think we should settle our problem today and not put it off any longer. I didn't know we had any problem, Mona. Oh, can't don't be difficult. You must know that something has happened to us. No, I'm, I'm afraid I don't. Well, try to understand what I'm saying, darling. If you hadn't been aware of it, that only proves my point. For heaven's sake, what point? That we've been drifting. Drifting apart. Mona, will you please stop beating around the bush and start making sense? Very well, Kent. It comes down to this. We don't love each other any longer. You don't love me. Is that what you mean? Not entirely. It should be obvious that you've stopped caring or you'd have noticed how I've changed. Have you changed? Yes, very much. Surely you must have sensed it. Sensed it? Well, no. Maybe love makes you blind. Please don't say that, Kent. Why not? Well, because I'm still fond of you. I don't want you to be angry with me. I just can't help my feelings, that's all. I... I can't turn them on and off whenever I choose. You've done pretty well so far. All right, Kent. At least I've been fair. You can't say I wasn't honest. I don't believe you. I don't believe a word you've said. I don't believe that you could stop loving me any more than I could stop loving you. Can't you stop, Kent? I'm sure you can if you try. No, not until you convince me. When I know you really don't care, then I'll stop. But not before. Oh, very well. What's the use of trying to be kind? You may as well know it all. I, I'm leaving town tomorrow. I won't be back, ever. That's very sudden. Yes, it's quite sudden. But Arthur insisted. Arthur? You don't know him, Kent. I didn't myself until a week ago. He's, he's, he's very attractive and quite charming. And, and I'm going to marry him. Do you hear me, Kent? I'm going to marry him. I'm going to marry him. I heard you. Is he rich? Oh, Kent, that's very unkind. I want you to leave now. I won't let you talk to me that way. I won't let anyone talk to me that way. Sorry. But for your information, since it seems so important, Arthur is quite well to do. Then I'm sure you'll be happy together. I'm sure of it, too. Now, will you please go? Shouldn't I kiss the bride? Isn't that what I'm supposed to do at a time like this? No. Not until after the wedding. I don't think I'll be able to attend. Thanks just the same. Have fun, Mona. Always have fun and live a wonderful life and forget about me. I know that won't take much effort. Goodbye, Mona, and good luck. Can't you... You... You forgot your hat? You 
think it's all over, don't you? But wait, fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. And now for the surprising conclusion of Finale, starring Lorreen Tuttle, a Hamilton Whitney production, written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt, and directed by Frank K. Danzig. Oh, Ken. Ken, darling. Is everything all right, mademoiselle? <laughs> yes, Julie. Yes, everything's all right. And you were wrong. Wrong? It went just as I expected. Every detail. Then you didn't tell him the truth. I convinced him that we were through. That was enough of the truth. If you say so, mademoiselle. <laughs> and now I'm going to my room for a few minutes. I... I'm very tired. We have a long trip ahead of us tomorrow. <gasps> Can I help you, mademoiselle? No. No, thank you. No. You must have moved that chair, Julie. I'm sorry. I, I should have told you. Doesn't matter. I'll have to get used to bumping in the furniture. I suppose in time, I'll develop a sense of things being close to me. I'm sure you will. But until I do, I'll go barging around like a bull in a china shop. You'll need a lot of patience to put up with me, Julie. Now that I'm going to be blind... Finale starred Miss Laureen Tuttle. Listen soon for another exciting story when one of your favorite motion picture stars meets the unexpected. <laughs> This program was transcribed in Hollywood. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Hey 
Hey Weirdos, I hope you're enjoying Retro Radio. I'm Darren Marlar, your host, and I wanted to jump in before we play this last show of the night. It's an episode of Dark Venture, and you might notice if you look at the show descriptions that I'm trying to remaster some of these to make them sound better before I present them to you. I tried to do that with this one as well, and there's going to be sections where the music and, well, just the gain was so loud that it's just, it just sounds staticky, uh, it sounds just overdriven, and I couldn't really do anything with those areas. But the rest of the episode, where you actually hear some clean dialogue, I was able to do a little magic in that. So, just wanted to warn you in advance, this could be a little bit tough on the ears in certain sections. Presented by Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which spark the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them into the unknown. Dark Venture. Adventure is brought to you by the Wild Root Company, makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. But first, a word about a hair tonic that is the choice of men everywhere. South of the border, the girls say que guapo. North of the border, they say how handsome. But everywhere, girls admire the man whose hair is groomed the Wild Root way. For Wild Root Cream Oil is famous for keeping your hair in trim the way girls like to see it neat and natural. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. What's more, it contains lanolin. So get the big economy-sized bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And ask your barber for Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now tonight's dark venture, Shape. <laughs> So, sent you over to write a human interest story on old Pop Doran, did they, eh? <laughs> well, sit down, young man, sit down. Hey, why are you so nervous? <laughs> Nothing to be nervous about here. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you won't believe it, my boy, but I figure there isn't a more exciting place in the whole world right here in this room. You know, there hasn't been a big newspaper store in this town for 38 years that I haven't known about in a way that nobody else could ever know. And all these years have proved one thing, my boy. No matter how we all bluster and strut, we're merely the toys of fate. Tim Porter and George Richards are the latest to prove what I mean. Uh, Tim, you know, was a big shot racketeer until they put him in the pen for ten years. While he was gone, George took over the firm, and he did all right, too. Yeah, I know every part of the story. You see, I, uh, I got my own weight finding out. <laughs> it began around 10.30, night before last. George was humming a song to himself as he stood before his dressing mirror, smoothing down his hair. Then he heard the outside door of his apartment open, but he didn't look up. Are you, Claire? Are you Cameron I'll be right with you. By yourself at home. Hey, what? What's well, new, Georgie? Yeah. Tim, how did you... Don't you listen to the radio? I'm the man of the hour. You broke out of prison. Something like that. 
Tim, you shouldn't have to find you. How long did you think I was going to stay buried, Georgie? How long did you think I was going to eat that slop and look at the moon through steel bars? You shouldn't have come here, Tim. This is one of the first places to look for you. I've always been a great believer in statistics. I figure I got about another hour before things get really tough. I'm going to spend that hour with you. Planning. All right, Tim. Try to get some enthusiasm into your voice, Georgie. What do you mean, brother? It's not going to be easy taking orders again after being the big shot for so long, is it? I just tried to hold things together for you, Tim. Okay. Now you can step down. I'm taking over again. But how? Every cop in the country will be looking for Money's a wonderful thing, Georgie. A buck in the right place is always worth miracles. I'll get along all right. And we'll talk about that later. Right now, I'll get my feet and half stuff. Run down to the restaurant, get me some sandwiches and coffee. I'll call up and have the kid bring, kid bring some more. Go get it yourself. I don't want nobody coming up here. But I don't... You ain't used to taking orders anymore, are you, Georgie? What's not that? Well, get right back where you started from when they filed me away. You're my number one boy. And that's all you are. Remember that, kid. You shouldn't talk to me like that. Look, I, I told you I was hungry. Two sandwiches and a pot of coffee. With plenty of cream. Okay. Okay, Tim. No feel too bad, Georgie. Some guys would give their right arm to be Tim Porter's number one boy. Number one boy. Where does he get that stuff? I ran things better than he ever did. Yeah. I don't have to take that from anyone. Well, what's it going to be tonight? Huh? We got some good roast beef on the dollar dinner. No. Day. Just want to use the phone over in the corner. Listen, I know you're looking for Tim Porter. He's in the second floor apartment at 612 Grand Avenue, but you better get your cops over there right away if you want to catch him. Me? I'm Santa Claus. That'll be a nickel. Yeah. Now I'll have some service, waiter. Now, yeah, what's it going to be? A cup of coffee. Black. <laughs> George drank his coffee right and slow, and then smoked a cigarette, and then ate a cup of coffee. Now, that's it, my clerk. He heard the sirens. George was getting a customer, so he laid out to get himself, and went out to see what was going on there. And when he came back, he asked later. Well, what'd you find out? Now, you know that guy who escaped from prison tonight? Tim Porter? Well, they got him trapped in an apartment just a couple of blocks from here. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, the squad of colors passed the other way. This time, the sirens were silent. George tried hard to hold back the little smile that kept tugging at his lips. They had missed coffee and walked slowly back to his apartment. Everything was quiet now. All the cops were gone, except for a detective, who had just come down the steps. Oh, you, George Richards. I want to talk to you. What's up? You know what's up, Big Shot. No, a guy on the street told me every cop in the city was here a while ago. Something wrong? You know your pal Tim Porter escaped from prison tonight? That's so? Cigarette? No. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't like it on. Yeah, I heard about that. I also heard his escape didn't last so long. I heard you boys found him again, right in this neighborhood. You heard wrong, Richards. We got a tip he was up in your apartment, but it was a phony. He's still at large. Hey, you better blow that match out. You're going to burn yourself. Well, George didn't have to worry about hiding that smile anymore. Somehow he got rid of the detective, 
Somehow he got upstairs near that partner. Somehow he had me poured himself a good drink. But the way his hand shook, most the drink spilled out. Didn't add it all. Before he could get it to his lips, phone had started ringing. George just stood there in the middle of the dark apartment. I could hear the fire and paralyzed every other of his body. He waited for the fire to stop ringing. But he kept right on him. As though whoever was at the other end of the line, there he was there. Five men. Who is it? Hello, George. Damn. Boy, was I worried. Worried? Yeah. Somebody tipped off the cops that you were up here in my apartment. I told you you shouldn't have come here, Tim. I thought you had got you. Am I glad you got away? I just about went nuts when I saw those police cars leaving. You still on the phone, Tim? Yeah, sure. It ain't polite to interrupt somebody when they're talking. You all through talking, Judge? Huh? Sure. Sure, boy. Boss? You ain't called me boss in a long time. Hey, it sounds good. How'd you... How'd you get away from him? Oh, I worked it. I'm, I'm sure glad you called me and told me everything's okay. Now, that's not why I called you, George. No? What time is it? Huh? Uh, about 20 after 11. Why, right, boys? Sometime between now and morning. I'm going to kill you. Kill me? What, what's the gag? You were the only one who knew I was at your apartment. No, wait a second. You don't think that I... The only one who could have called the cops. Oh, but I swear I didn't, boys. I swear I didn't. As soon as you hang up this phone, you better start running, George. Oh, listen, you got it all wrong. No matter where you run, remember this. You won't get away from me. I want to explain to you, boys. You won't get away from me. Boys, listen to me. Hello. Hello. <laughs> George hurried to the closet where I kept his gun. He ain't opened the closet door, looked on the top shelf. Not here. He took it. I should have known. George rushed to the end that looked down in the backyard. At the end of the street lamp, he saw the garage door wide open. His car was gone. Dad hit the up too. Then it started. The voice. Like a whisper in this brain. You won't get away from me. Huh? You won't get away from me. George Spy Rhymes had expected your care to be out your own alive. But of course, the end was empty. You won't get away from me. The rest of the guy, they'll stick by me. I've been on the square with them. They don't help me. Yeah. I'll call John right now. I'll tell him what Tim's trying to do. The boys will sit by me. I still remember how Tim used to push them around, too. I always treated them fine. Hello? Oh, hello, John. This is George. I just heard... John? John? He hung up. He never did that before. <laughs> Mikey, this is George. What do you want, George? You know Tim broke loose tonight. Yeah. The boss told us what you did. Oh, but listen, I did... We're all looking for you. If we find you, we're going to give you to Tim for a present. Then it was how it went. One in the corner after the other. They were all on Tim's side. And that plan started going through George's head again. You won't get away from him. Yeah. What am I hearing? You won't get away from me. Tim. Tim. You won't get away from me. We'll return to our story as soon as Harry Waltham has a word with the men. Men, here's important news on good grooming. Better than four out of five new users of Wild Root Cream Oil say they prefer Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics. Here is new and even more conclusive evidence that Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. So if you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, 
How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally. It relieves annoying dryness and it removes loose, ugly dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Now back to our dark venture for tonight. Chase. George Witch's last night just proved my theory about fate watching us from the sidelines and laughing at us. I love being playing. <laughs> well, I guess you're wondering what part I played in all this, since I know so much about it, eh? Well, I played a mighty important part. Maybe you can figure out what it was, huh? <laughs> When George realized the rest of the gang were on Tim Porter's side, he knew there was only one thing left for him to do. Get out of town fast. So at 1.20 in the morning, he began looking for some way to escape. I want to rent a car. Yeah, any good car. Yeah, for just a couple of days. I don't care what it costs. Can you take care of me? Well, how long are you open? All night? Okay. <laughs> George hurried to his bedroom to pack a few clothes in a suitcase. And as he ransacked his dresser, he happened to glance into the dresser mirror. He'd aged ten years in the last hour. His face was drawn, deathly pale. His eyes glittered like the eyes of a of a trapped animal. The doorbell. We'll pick up these this time of the night. Let's take off it. It's my yeast car. They come for me. I gotta get out of here. George went to the back door of the apartment. No one is there. He hurried down the steps. Then suddenly... There he is! Yeah, Wolf, you gotta wait to help me. Finally, he came out of the alley into a side street. He'd escaped them. But for how long? Yeah, Wolf. Yes, what can I do for you, mister? I talked to you on the phone a while ago about renting a car. Oh, yes, yes, I remember. Well, I think I can take care of it. Good. Him. You won't be taking it out of town, will you? No, no, just in the city, but I need it right away. All right. Oh, I told you about the deposit. It's going to take quite a bit. It's all right. Okay. Now, if I can see your driver's license. Uh, just for identification, of course. Yeah. Here, here it is. Okay. Let's see. George Rich. Rich? What's wrong? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I had you come way out here for nothing, Mr. Richards. What? On second thought, I was wrong about that car. I haven't got a thing on the lot that will do you any good. What are you talking about? You just told me I, I haven't have... got a thing, Mr. Richards. What are you trying to pull? My dough's as good as anybody else's. It's not that. But renting you a car would be pretty risky. What do you mean by that? Well, well, there's no reason why I shouldn't tell you. In my business, i got to keep my ear pretty close to the ground, as they say. And according to what I hear, well... By morning, you're going to be a dead man, Mr. Richards. So George was right back where he started, with Tim and all the boys looking for him. Now he began going around all the hideouts that the boys had used in the old days, the little side street hotels and dark warehouses, anywhere they might hide until tomorrow. I'm not me, George. I can't help you. And you know why. The cop trail, you, would be different. But it's Tim Porter, and if he found you here, he'd scare me alive. Just for the night, Charlie. Just nah, no, sorry, George. Wow. This is a nice surprise for the middle of the night, Mr. Richards. To what does the police department owe the pleasure of this visit? Look, Inspector, you got to help me. Help you? Tim's going to kill me before morning. Put me in a cell. Do anything but help me. Relax, relax. 
Now, it's not becoming for such an important member of our community to whimper like this. Now, just why is Tim going to kill you? I thought you were his right-hand man. I'm the one who called in that tip tonight about him being in my apartment. Is that right? Yeah, and he knows about it, so he's going to kill me. You see, I was trying to help you guys, so it's only right that you should try to help me. Trying to help us, huh? How stupid do you think we are, Richard? Huh? What do you mean? That tip was as phony as this act you're putting on. But you're wrong. I tell think you... now that we know pretty close to where Tim was when that tip came through. We thought it was on a level. Well, it was on a level. I don't think so. I think you called to throw us off the trail long enough for Tim to reach his hideout. Oh, I tell you, you're wrong. And when you go back to Tim, you tell him that 500 cops are out looking for him, and that when we find him, he'd better be awful polite. Now get out of here. No. Get out of here. Please, please, Inspector. I... Don't get out of here. <laughs> Clear in the morning, George walked down the brass dash on steps. And yet it was said Eric was now completely his enemy. Every shadow, every sudden sound could mean vile death. Brother? Oh. Wait, wait, stick up on me like that. Help, Brian, brother. Oh. Yeah, here. Bless you, brother. Yeah, thanks. He'd use it. Speak. He had talk about my car, but I didn't know he had before. So many of time. What are they waiting for? Maybe that's Tim and the others. Maybe they spotted me. I better get out of here. And I a car. Two lovers climbing together. Quite sure that this was the best of all worlds. Now, all George's footsteps grind just a little. All the strand of the wire I was catching up with him. Grand heavier. Grabs were like chunks of wood. Strength left him. And as he ended, he saw the hairpress of a subway station. Subway. There wouldn't be a body near the subway train. Maybe. Here, you can get some sleep. Well, George started down the steps. But the subway was dark and empty. And halfway down, they suddenly stopped by a barricade of ropes and labor. And the end of the barricade was a sign. George could barely read it by the dim light in the street above. Closed for repair. Fact, he's a server for 56th Street State. 56th Street. We're ten blocks from here. <laughs> How do you like that? Even the lousy subway won't give me a break. <laughs> ten blocks through those dark streets with Tim up there looking for me. Oh, no, no. I'm going down there. It's going to be a push to rock. <laughs> I said it was a subway. That one for the books. Okay, I can get through it now. The darkened platform is completely deserted. And there Connie saw a bench. He stumbled toward it. Sang down. He was exhausted. So tired. So tired. His head drooped. His mind spun into darkness. <laughs> By morning, you're going to be a dead man, Mr. Richards. Dead man? No, no. When we find you, we're going to give you the Tim for a bet. Hey, listen, Mike. Go on, get out of here with that phony story. Hey, Inspector, you got to believe me. You won't get away from me. George woke suddenly. Huh? First, he didn't know why. And then he realized Sonny was coming down the subway steps. He's down here. I spotted him coming in about an hour ago. You sure, Tim? Pretty sure. They found me. Quiet them. Don't make a sound. Turn your light around. Okay. Here, somewhere. George watched the beam of light. It's toward him. And keep away. Which man? Searching for him. 
He crouched down, his lips trembled. Then suddenly the light was full in his face. There he is. So we finally caught up? No, you're not taking me to tip. I'm not taking me to tip. I'm going here. Okay. I think I got it. Down there at the end of the platform. George watched them come close. He tried to sit out. Tommy did. He tried to crawl away. But it was useless. You won't get away from me. You won't get away from me. No. I didn't get away from him. You will not. I didn't get away. It looks like he did pretty bad. Better get him out of it. Hey, Phil. Look at this guy. Huh? He doesn't look like the description of the one we're at. He must be. What's he doing down here? I don't know, Bill. I hope he didn't make a mistake. No start that. You know as well as I, the company gave us orders. Get the thief from breaking in down here. Wait. That's what they said. Wait. I only followed orders. Wait. Thief? Orders? Ain't you guys working for Tim? Hey, Bill. Who's this? Who do you mean, boss? How should I? Come on. Help me with it. No way. Wait. You're not working for Tim. He didn't get me after all. <laughs> I did get away. Billy. Tim. Bill. Look. He's dead. <laughs> About an hour later, five o'clock, yeah, and that boy's brought him down here. And then I played my part in the story, like I said. What do you want him, Pop? Uh, bring him over here. Me and that other Okay. Two within the last couple of hours. This morgue, getting to be the busiest place in the whole city. Yeah, my job down here at the morgue might sound pretty depressing, though. But it really is the old fella. Kind of makes you feel philosophical after a while. Like Jim Porter's boast and how George thought it hadn't worked out. But it did work out. Well, you see, that other body of the ambulance guy talked about was Tim Porter. He'd been ambushed and shot to death at 3.30 in the morning, 10 miles from that subway where George was sleeping. Yep. But uh, George didn't really get away from Tim after all. There you are, lying side by side. Next week at the same time, the Wild Root Company, makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the Hair, will bring you another original Dark Venture story. In the meantime, remember, the man who makes the best impression is the man who puts good grooming first. And you can do that, fellows, by using Wild Root Cream Oil. This grand non-alcoholic hair tonic is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And here's why Wild Root Cream Oil is so popular. It gives a man everything he wants in a hair tonic, grooms his hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, Wild Root Cream Oil contains soothing lanolin that's so much like the oil of your skin. And remember, no other leading hair tonic gives you all of these advantages. So take Wild Root's FM test. If you find signs of dryness or loose dandruff, you need Wild Root cream oil again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. On the next Tuesday, remember, smart girls use Wild Root cream oil, too, for quick good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanent. Mothers say it's great for training children there. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. 
Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.